In any city, in any country, seek out any school or educational facility you can find. When you reach the front desk, ask to see the person who calls himself the holder of chance. If the secretary shows any signs of fear, give the request again and do not relent. Eventually, your perseverance will pay off and you will be led to a deserted classroom in a closed down wing of the school. Scraps of police tape and faded chalk profiles will litter the floor and the door will be sealed behind you before you can inquire anything. At this point, you must choose one of the 30 desks. Sit down and wait. Only one of these desks will allow you to keep your life. Advising you to choose wisely would be little good, as there's no way to tell if you have done so until it's too late. After a short wait, you should begin to hear things. Children laughing, droning lectures and the occasional snore. But these are merely echoes of a time when the classroom was host to nothing more devious than homework and pop quizzes. As you wait, the sounds will slowly change. Where there was once laughter and lectures, there will now be screams of agony and howls of despair. Shades of the classroom's horrible history will begin to take shape around you. Do not fear the shapes as they are harmless. The beast they can coalesce into, however, is not. As your wait continues, the shadows will grow more numerous and the classroom's history will unfold in increasingly gruesome detail. This part has driven many men into fits of tears and more still into madness. Should you reach the end of this macabre production with your sanity intact, you will find out if you have chosen wisely. If you have chosen incorrectly, the shapes will take form. They are hideous mockeries of what they were in life, half-formed doppelgangers of those long dead. There is no escape from this room now. They will tear you apart ever so slowly, taking twisted delight in inflicting the pain they have suffered on someone else. It will take you days, perhaps even weeks to die, the only consolation you will have is that you will likely lose your sanity after the first few hours. If you were lucky and chose the one correct desk, the shapes will gather around you, coalescing into a pitch black mass. When it disappears, you will find yourself in the most lavish casino imaginable. It is populated by those who have played the game so long that their flesh has long since rotted away, for death is forbidden from entering this casino, and yet still play, hoping to gain their freedom. The casino has but two exits. One leads to a wasteland where fell beasts roam and nothing but certain death awaits. The cost to pass through this is four silver coins. The other door will take you to what you seek, and it's the only chance for you to leave with your life. The cost to pass through is five gold coins. You will be holding a single silver coin in your hand. Don't fret. As long as you are in this casino, you can never have any less than this one coin. A nearby sign will tell you that three silvers equal one gold. You must play if you do not wish to be trapped here for good. But remember the old casino boss's idiom. You can't beat the house. Nearly every game is rigged in favour of the house and the precious few which aren't change at random, serving only to trick and confuse you. The odds are most definitely not in your favour if you do begin to win, take care to keep your fortune as secret as possible, as the damned around you have not been so lucky. Bear in mind that you cannot die in this place and that boastfulness may inspire them to turn on you in a fit of jealous hatred, ripping great chunks of flesh 
out of your body until their jealousy is quenched and their bloodlust sated. If, against all odds, you manage to gather the five gold coins to enter the door unmolested by the other gamblers, you will find yourself in an elevator. It will take you up to an office even more opulent than the casino below. Behind the desk at the far end of the room will sit a skeletal figure, dressed in the finest suit you will ever see. Approach the desk and stand before it, asking only one question. Will you roll? It will nod and produce a pair of dice from its jacket. Call the roll, evens or odds. If you lose, the skeleton will grin and you will take its place, waiting thousands of years for the next seeker to be so lucky as to reach your new abode. If you should win, however, it will let loose a whale that will unbind the magics that hold the place together. Death will finally enter the casino below, granting the wretched gamblers the rest that has for so long been denied them. As the casino disintegrates around you, stand perfectly still. Hopefully, you will not be taken with it. But if you are, there is no being in this world who can say what will happen to you. If you are not taken, you will reappear in the classroom. It will be exactly the same as you left it, save a mound of dust and rotting cloth at your feet. Within it, you will find a pair of dice. As soon as you touch them, the door will unlock. That pair of dice is object 75 of 538. With every roll, they take another life. Will yours be the next they claim? In any city, in any country, go to any mental institution or halfway house you can get yourself to. When you reach the front desk, ask to visit someone who calls himself the Holder of Sanity. The receptionist will look at you strangely, but you must repeat the same question and nothing else. Eventually, she'll call for a doctor and you'll be taken to the room in the furthest corner of the institution. Beware, but after this point, there is no turning back. And if you wish to leave then, tell the doctor that you are sorry and you must not have taken your medication today and leave. Run as far away as you can, outside the city limits, outside of the country limits, for cowards are not spared if caught. If you continue on, you will be put into a straitjacket and locked in a padded room. After a few days that will seem like months, you will start to hear voices, hundreds of them, all talking about how their lives were ruined. Their stories may drive you mad, and you would have to stay there for all eternity, for in your padded room there is no death, only torture. If the voices stop talking, close your eyes tight and shout at the top of your lungs, I will not share your stories. If the voices do not resume, pray that the pain you will next feel will not be so bad, however unlikely that is. As the voices continue talking, single out the voice that speaks of the very hospital you are in. Listen to his story and open your eyes. You will not be in the cell anymore, but still in a straitjacket. Instead, you will be in what seems like an endless void. The only thing separating you from the void? A glass box. A man will appear in front of you and ask if you have any questions. He will respond to one and only one question. Ask what drove them to insanity. He will explain in horrifying detail about the lives and deaths of them. During his response, a large black dot will appear to be moving through the void, but you must not focus your sight on it, for it will shatter the glass box, leaving you to fall into the void for all eternity. Once the man has finished his story, he will remove your straitjacket and bid you farewell. You will find yourself standing outside the institution, holding the straitjacket. The jacket is object 72 of 538. You can only pray that you may never wear it again.
in any city, in any country. Go to any schoolhouse you can get yourself into. Go to the principal and ask to see the holder of angst. If they hesitate for even a second, you're in the right place. If they refuse to acknowledge your question, ask them again. Eventually, they will grudgingly give in. They will take you to the basement of the school. As you are descending the steps, a feeling of uncertainty will wash over you. No matter how you try, the feeling will remain in the back of your mind, growing stronger with every step. The principal will lead you to the farthest corner of the basement. The closer you get to the corner, the more light is sapped out of your surroundings. With the light goes all feeling of hope. They will frantically start brushing the cobwebs and dust off the walls that connect at the corner. Once they complete this, both walls will have a brick with an indent just big enough to fit your hand into. The principal will leave without a word, and it will be clear to you that you are on your own from this point onward. You will have to decide between the two walls. Be careful though, as one contains horrors beyond the human imagination, while the other leads you forward. Either way leads to regret. If you manage to pick the door that leads onwards, you will see a dark, musty corridor. It will be darker than anything you may have thought possible. But walk in as straight a line as you can. If you collide with something warm and vaguely human, stop moving. Do not move or else you should regret your very existence. If you remain still, the warm blooded mass should vanish as if in mist. Once this happens, speed up your pace. You will eventually think that you see a light, but it is simply a trick. Do not go towards the light, for if you do, your very essence shall be in peril. At the end of this tunnel, you will feel what seems to be a door. It will be reminiscent of a medieval dungeon, with a small barred window and a wooden plank keeping the door from opening. Once you've made it this far, there is no turning back. You cannot do anything other then unbar the door and walk inside. Once you pull the door shut behind you, there will be a deep voice in your ears, speaking a language you will not understand. It will sound as if it's everywhere and nowhere, and its incomprehensible words shall chill you to your bones. Do not move. Do not speak. Wait until the voice is done, until you so much as breathe. If you do not follow these instructions, your last sound shall be tormented screaming. When the voice finishes, wait a moment. Turn slowly and face the holder of angst. He will be wearing torn strips of cloth and his body will be scarred. He will look at you with eyes so full of grief and sorrow you may almost cry yourself. Do not. He will start speaking about his life, but his voice will be but a whisper. He will describe torments too horrific to understand. Terrors that will make your ears bleed, but listen. Listen and do not close your eyes or cover your ears, for you won't need them if you do. During his story, he will cling to your shirt and ask you to help him escape his personal hell. Stay silent, as this is but a ruse. Once he is finished, he will curl into a fetal position and sob quietly. You have only a small amount of time until his crying drives you mad. Ask him. What will happen if they are brought together? The holder will be standing, even though he was just in a ball on the floor. His face will contort with an odd mix of rage and fear. He will run around, throwing unseen objects around the small, empty room. You will hear porcelain, glass, even wood break and shatter around you, even though there's nothing there. He will be ranting loudly in a language that was not meant for human ears. Again, wait. Stay still and silent until his fury is released. The moment he is done, he will sit down. He will begin to explain the reasons why they should never have been created, the atrocities that they have caused and the unimaginable power they contain. He will stop on occasion, to sob or throw another imaginary yet real object. But he will not be done. No, his madness has been driven too far, too deep to be done in a matter of minutes. He will speak for what seems like hours, and then days, 
Those days will turn into months and then into decades and into millennia. You must not falter, no matter how long it seems you have been standing there. Once what seems like an eternity has passed, he will stand slowly and walk to you. He will lightly touch the sides of your head with his palms and knowledge will flow through your very being. The holder will look at you with a look of blissful relief as his madness has finally left him. The moment you blink, he will be gone. The knowledge he has given you is object 501 of 538 and it must never be reunited with the others for reasons which you will now fully understand. This understanding will eventually drive you to insanity. I used to see him often. Well, I guess I shouldn't say him. More like it. Then I moved away, to another state, another city. I don't see it anymore. Not physically, though it creeps through my mind in its swooping, slinking way. High up in the air one moment, and then sliding across the ground the next. Over and over and over, its limbs propelling it forward. The mere thought sends ice-cold shivers running down my spine. It used to watch me, but it can't anymore. At least, I don't think it can. I wouldn't be surprised, however, to wake in the early hours of the day when the sky is still dark and look to my window to see those eyes, those teeth, see it smile, that awful smile. I hope I'm dead before that day arises. I hope I've seen the last of that monster. When I was little, I lived in a small suburban neighbourhood. It isn't the kind you're probably thinking of. Big white uniform houses, all lined up in perfect rows with green lawns and two garage doors. No, my neighbourhood was much older. It was built sometime in the 50s. Every house looked different, but most had started to fall apart. People living there were hard-working and honest, for the most part and their long, hard lives showed on their faces. No one really talked to anyone else. That was one of the only things I didn't like about that neighbourhood. My mother always said the neighbours just liked to keep to themselves, that they had nothing very important to say anyway. Looking back on it now, I think they did have something important to say. Something very, very important. I saw it for the first time when I was eight years old, during the summer. It was very hot that season, unusually so compared to all the summers I've had since then, so I'd stayed inside most of the morning. Then, after lunch, my father hooked up the sprinkler we used for our garden in our backyard. I excitedly got into play clothes and rushed outside into the blinding sun. Those were the days. Those innocent days in the sun where I played without a care, I had no idea I would soon be missing them. So, I was outside, running and laughing and jumping through the cool spray of water, when I saw it. At first, I didn't notice it. It was just a rustle in the bushes, and it was the crack of a branch, and I looked up. Something, something dark moved through those leaves, something as black as midnight. Yet it shimmered when the sun hit it. It ran, or galloped to this day, I'm still not sure what to call it, from a small forest behind my house, leapt over my neighbour's fence and disappeared from my view. I was curious, so I chased it. The pavement burned my feet, but I didn't care. I watched, along with a few other neighbourhood children, as the creature swept in and out of the shadows of trees, making its way down the street. It was large, probably about eight feet tall if it stood upright, though it never did. Instead, it stayed hunched over, its hind legs curled up at its sides, the knees protruding grotesquely past its torso. Large, white, curled claws grew from bony feet and long slender fingers. 
Its arms were gnarled, the joints bulging under twisted muscle and skin. Skin that was black and rubbery, stretched thin over whatever bones the beast had. It caved in at odd places and almost looked as if it were rotting. Still, when it crept through the sun, patches glistened grey and blue, as if it were made of some kind of foreign glass. Then there was its face. The skin was the same, stretched over an oblong oval skull that jutted out in the back. Its eyes were sunken deep within its head, large round and hollow. They glowed a weirdly white yellow, one I'm sure doesn't even have a name to this day. Really, it wasn't even glowing, it was more of a pulsating, ever-present light that seemed to come straight from some non-existent soul deep within the monster's core. It always seemed to smile, its mouth was stretched like its skin far across its face. You know the expression, grinning ear to ear? It was literal in this case, each corner reaching each side of its face where ears would have been if it had any. Within this smile were two rows of pure white teeth, long and sharp. In fact, each tooth was so long it could never close its mouth. The sharp tips just clacked against each other as it skulked around, waving its head slowly from side to side, as if sniffing something in the air. I used to find this silly, since it had no nose. Now the thought terrifies me. We kids just watched it in a sort of dazed amazement, never having seen something like it before. I suppose I thought it was just some species I'd yet to learn about in school. I wish that's all it had been. Then our parents called us back inside for dinner, and we grudgingly obeyed, not wanting to get in trouble. I'm not sure about the other kids, but I never quite forgot about the creature I'd seen. I got preoccupied with other things, sure, but its image was always in the back of my mind, burning there, waiting for me to remember it late at night while I tried to drift off to sleep. It got its wish. That night, I was lying in bed, with my covers pulled up to my chin despite how hot it was. The nightlight across the room barely gave me comfort from the thoughts of ghouls and ghosts hiding in my closet or under my bed. Then, the beast's image slipped into my thoughts. I gripped the covers. It hadn't scared me before, yet I'd been mere feet away from it. But now, after having the image sit in my mind all day, my brain registering its unworldly appearance, I started to fear it. It was bad. I knew that now. Then I heard a tap. I froze. Another tap. I didn't dare move. Then there was another, and another, and another. It was at my window. I could hear its long claws scrape across the glass, hear its razor-sharp fangs as they clicked together. I could hear its breathing, heavy, husky, in and out, in and out. Finally, I could no longer bear it. I tore my eyes from my nightlight and gazed through the dark room towards my window. It smiled when it saw me, an impossibly huge grin that split its face in two, white teeth glistening with saliva gleaming eyes seeming to pull every fear from my conscious and unconscious to the surface. I screamed. By the time my parents rushed into my room, it was gone. No traces of its existence left behind. They said it was just a nightmare. It wasn't just a nightmare. I never saw it in the daytime again, but I saw it every night. After a week, I stopped screaming. I just cried silently in my bed. Then, after another week, I stopped crying. I knew I was scared. I wasn't going to give it the satisfaction of seeing me tremble. It wasn't until it found the lock on my window that I was truly terrified. I'll never forget the clunk the lock made when it had been moved for the first time in years or the waning screech of the window as it slid open, or the heavy breathing at my bedside. 
I'll never forget those eyes as they gazed at me from beyond my covers. It knew I was scared. It thrived on that. It wouldn't leave me alone. Everyone says I went crazy, but I didn't. It just wouldn't leave me alone. I hardly ever slept. My hair started to fall out and I always looked tired. My parents put me here in this psychiatric hospital. It's a nut house, that's what it is. I'm not crazy. It's been years, years. The nightmares still happen when I do sleep, so they keep me here. I suppose I like it better this way though. After all, the monster can't get me here. You know, the funny thing is, I can't even remember where I used to live. I can't remember the state or the city. I can't even remember the country. I will be the first to admit that what I did in my youth was monstrous. But that is no reason why I must be afflicted with such nightmarish terrors. It is inhumane to live like this, but I will not be forced out of my own home, built by my own ancestors. I am an Alvarado, the last of the richest family in Guanajuato. So what if nobody wants to work for me anymore? Ignorant peasants. I have enough money and rifles to outlive whatever it is that afflicts this hacienda. But, as brave as my words are, my soul cannot match them. I fear. I tremble when the sun goes out. It is out there. It is here. It is everywhere. The horrendous beast with its large yellow eyes and the surrounding dark void. It cannot be described further a demon. I feel like it is its duty to kill me, but not a quick death. It wants to make my life unbearable. It wants me to do it the favour of killing myself. I have seen it once or twice. I have shot at it with no effect. It is like shooting at twisted lights or shadows. If it was just my fear of seeing it, I would have taken it. But it screams like the cat it once was. It yells like the little girls I have murdered. The demon cat of one of one. It was the eighth year anniversary of my brother's disappearance. My parents, as usual, sat by the fireplace, mindlessly rocking back and forth in their rapidly deteriorating redwood chairs, wallowing in their never-ending sorrow. I could never understand why people bothered commemorating such devastating events. It always seemed like such a waste of emotions to me. But in spite of their pain, day after day, they took blame for what happened, encasing themselves within a makeshift tomb constructed of past regrets. Why did we let him go? Are we bad parents? Was it our fault? I knew, though I desperately wanted to disprove it, that most of the blame befell upon me. I was supposed to watch him that fateful night, the night of that accursed show. I was granted temporary responsibility of being his caretaker, and I had failed miserably. I yearned for the chance to relive that night. Maybe I could have kept a better eye on him, or held his hand so he wouldn't get lost. The tragedy of losing a relative at the age of ten isn't something you forget, but at the risk of sounding egoistic, it's not something I want to reminisce either. Despite how much it pained me, however, I wanted to learn the truth. I wanted answers to my parents' unending questions. Questions that forced tightened cuffs upon their psyche, trapping them within their mental prisons. That moment came when I received word 
that the same puppet show that caused our burdens would be returning to town. I would finally receive my answers. Being the ripe age of 18, I had no problems acquiring a ticket to the show on my own. I decided against notifying my parents of my whereabouts, knowing that if I told them, they would forbid me to go. It was just as I remembered. The building for the performance was decayed and putrescent. Its walls were stripped of most of its paint and vibrant green vines lengthened along its sides. The inside, however, was the complete opposite. The walls were adorned with red and black colored wallpaper. Posters and stringed lights decorated the room. Small chairs gathered around a large wooden stage, draped behind scarlet red curtains. It was like walking into an old, abandoned building, only to be greeted with a beautiful oasis. The show wouldn't begin for another 30 minutes, although many were already arriving. I took my seat in the far back and waited patiently for the show to begin. Aside from a few subtle changes and the addition of new puppets, it was the same show that I'd experienced in my childhood. My eyes swelled up with tears at the thought of my brother. I'd found it difficult to focus on the show any longer. Just as I was ready to make my departure, one of the puppets caught my eye. It had soft, curly brown hair and eyes that shimmered with the brightest pools of blue. It had uncanny resemblance to my brother a carbon copy of how he looked right before his kidnapping. It even bore the same clothing as he, jean overalls draped over a white shirt. I was dumbfounded. It had to be a coincidence. Rapid thoughts flashed through my mind like multiple bolts of lightning striking all at once. Could this man, this puppeteer, be the one behind my brother's disappearance? I needed to find proof of my disquieting discovery before pointing blame. I had waited for the show to end, and while he was distracted with autographs, I stealthily snuck away to his dressing room. I was surprised to find the door unlocked. I cautiously twisted the knob in my trembling fist, my heartbeat steadily increasing as I ascended into the room. Silhouettes of marionettes hung from the ceiling and sat among the many shelves the room held. A sliver of light beaming from the hallway illuminated the room only slightly. I trailed my fingers along the wall in search of a light source, my hand eventually coming in contact with one. I flicked the switch, only to be greeted with the most haunting display. My stupefied gaze was not met with the sight of marionettes, but with children. Children who were reported missing from neighbouring towns and cities all gathered together to partake in the puppeteer's demented puppet show. Many of their limbs had been amputated and stitched back into place, eyes gouged out of their sockets and placed in jars, soaking in an unknown liquid, their mouths cut to their ears and sewn shut. Drips of dried blood leaked from their orifices. Some had their heads decapitated from their bodies and attached to that of a doll's. I swallowed hard, forcing down the vomit that erupted from the pits of my stomach. I stared, awestruck at the hellish sight I was now witnessing. The ability to move had left me. I heard footsteps quickly approaching my location. I spun around, only to have my eyes meet with the puppeteers. He was holding my brother, or what was left of him. I wasted no time in sprinting away as fast as I could. I was relieved to hear the absence of steps behind me. As soon as I arrived home, I called the police. My parents, noticing how frantic I was, kept questioning if I was okay, but I couldn't answer them. The police arrived about a half hour later. I was too distraught to give a detailed statement, but told them as much as I could. Three days later, they were able to capture and apprehend the puppeteer. The remains of the children were all returned to their families and allowed a proper burial. The puppeteer was given death sentence for his crimes, scheduled to take place within the next 20 years. As of late, word had gotten out of his escape from prison. 
Somehow, before escaping, he managed to write out my name on the cell walls with his own blood. No one knows how he learned my name. I opted to stay anonymous for the duration of the trial and did not appear in person. The cops guessed he was able to get a hold of the police records and recognise my picture from my encounter with him. If that's the case, then my faith is now entrusted in the protective agency and the reassurance that our location was well hidden. I just hope it stays that way. I recently moved out of my old house, and before I left, I found this letter. It was in my garage, in an empty fish tank I was planning on giving away. I don't know who wrote it, and I don't know what to do. The following is a transcription of the letter. I've decided to write this down, just in case you find it. You might, and you might not. I'm satisfied either way. I really wasn't going to contact you at all. I mean, I certainly didn't plan on it. But of course, I also didn't plan on you leaving. So now that I know we don't have much time left together, I thought this might be an appropriate goodbye. I've taken good care of you. I try to stay humble, but I don't think I'm overstating when I say I've taken excellent care of you. I was there for you every step of the way. When you were sick, when you were down, and of course, all the normal days. Those were the ones when you needed me the most, I think. I didn't even hold it against you when you almost found me and called the police. I was hurt, of course, but I try to let bygones be bygones. And I suppose that was partially my fault anyway. I tried to remember to close the window every time I went in or out of the house. But, I'll admit, I got sloppy from time to time. I only left it open to let in some fresh air, but I forgot to close it before you got home. It was a careless mistake, and you'll note that I never repeated it. But calling the police over was a bit excessive, don't you think? No harm was done, of course. You never found me. But I still feel it was a breach of trust. Some good did come of it, though. I decided to avoid leaving the house as much from then on, which gave me more time with you. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to talk about it so much. Like I said, I try to forgive and forget, so I'll just say I'm sorry I scared you and leave it at that. Did you know you had mice in your house? I doubt you did. I know how much you hate rodents, and you would have done something had you known they were there. But I got rid of them for you. You never even knew. That's the best part. I love it when I can keep the environment controlled and really see what you're like when you're alone. Did you know you left the stove on three separate times when you left the house? I had to turn it off for you. That's how good of a caretaker I am. And then there's the way you never thought to clean the lint trap in your dryer. I had to do that too. I swear, it's like you were trying to burn your house down. But, even more than that, I enjoyed the normal day-to-day -day tasks. I gave you food. When something in your fridge expired, I replaced it. It's funny, the first time I did this, I thought for sure you'd notice. But you didn't. I started slow, only replacing one or two things that you weren't likely to check, and then subconsciously you began to take it for granted that your food was always good. It was a gradual process, but frankly I was surprised at how quickly you adapted. That was one of my favourite parts, watching you grow dependent on my care without ever knowing it. It was things like that that brought me the most joy. I cleaned your floors, 
I watered your plants. Once I even washed your dishes. You always did that in the evening, but one night you forgot, so I did it for you. You didn't notice that either. I took very good care of you. So why didn't I show myself? Why didn't I take credit for my benevolence? Well, it wasn't because I thought you would be upset that I was living in your house. Though that did cross my mind when you called the police on me for leaving the window open. I'm sorry, I don't mean to keep bringing it up, but that was really uncalled for. No, I didn't show myself because I wanted to observe you. I wanted to watch you in a completely detached setting. If you had known I was there, it wouldn't be the same. You and I have a very close relationship. And I didn't want to ruin it by introducing all the messiness of interaction. You have an aquarium in your living room. You take care of the fish. Well, actually, I take care of the fish. You keep forgetting to feed them. But, for now, let's just pretend you take care of the fish. And what do the fish do in return? They live. Sure, they live very different lives than they would in the wild, but they don't know that. That's what it's like for me and you. I take care of you, and I ask nothing in return. I just watch. I've learned so much about you in the time I've been caring for you. I know your most obvious traits all the way down to the smallest details. I know how you act, how you move, how you think. I know where you would look for me in your house and where you wouldn't. It's this understanding that made me even better at taking care of you. I learned how to suggest things to you, to plant ideas in your mind with perfect subtlety. I noticed when you were lonely and decided you needed a dog. I knew you had owned a dog previously, and I knew that every year you got that plastic Christmas tree from the closet you barely opened. So I put your old dog leash where you would see it in the closet, just to help you remember. Of course, that wasn't enough to make you get a dog, but it was an accumulation of things like that. I won't bore you with the details, but it worked, didn't it? I take care of your dog, too. I was always there to steer you in the right direction and make you do what's best for you. I helped you decide what to wear, where to go, who your friends were, and all kinds of things. I took good care of you. But all good things must come to an end. I know you're going to be moving out soon. It's a bittersweet end to a beautiful relationship, but I know our time is up. I considered moving out with you, but to be honest, I think I've learned everything I need to about you. I hope you don't take this the wrong way, but I've almost become bored of you. It's all right. There are only so many things you can know about a person. So as a goodbye, I'm going to hide this note somewhere. I know most of the places you would or wouldn't find it. I'm going to try my hardest to find somewhere that I don't know if you'll look. Like I said, I know you. So, seeing whether you find this note, and seeing how you react if you do, will be one last surprise. I hope you can learn how to take care of yourself without me, and thank you all the good times we've had. With love, your caretaker. I have a story to tell you, but I beg you not to read it. Please, don't. I know it sounds stupid, but by the time you understand why, it will be too late. I know this will not deter many of you, 
but without this simple warning to ease my conscience, I may not be able to go through with this. And I desperately need to go through with this. Let me start at the beginning. I have an old friend, Joe, who I've known since grade school. I'm in my late twenties, so is he, and he's been my friend for at least half of that time. I'd say that we knew each other pretty well after all of that time. This may seem irrelevant and uninteresting, but I have to stress this. I know him, and I know him well. What he did was... It, it was nothing he ever could have done without some outside influence. On the night of Friday, January 23rd, I was driving to his apartment to pick him and his roommate up. We made plans to go out, hit a couple of bars, and generally have a good start to the weekend. When I arrived, there were a number of police cars and ambulances outside the complex. I was, of course, curious, as I, like many people, rarely see such sights. As I got closer, I noticed a body covered in a bag in the street, surrounded by glass and no more than a few feet from a badly dented car. I'm rather horrified, coming to the conclusion that someone was hit by a car and killed right outside the complex. As I finished gawking, I made my way inside and up the stairs to the third floor. That's where my friend's apartment is, and that's where I found it wasn't a simple accident. The police were upstairs as well, talking to residents and taping off one of the apartments. My friend's apartment. Panicked, I asked one of the officers what happened, why my friend's apartment was taped off. I told him I was supposed to be meeting them for drinks and asked if they were okay. The officer told me that it had appeared that Joe had butchered his roommate with a kitchen knife and thrown himself through the plate glass sliding door into the street below. I was a ghost, shaken so badly I could barely answer the simple questions the officer asked me upon finding that I knew the victims. My mind couldn't process it. I knew him. He'd never do such an atrocity. It didn't make sense. I made my way back to my car in silence and drove home as though on autopilot. I couldn't get the shock of it all out of my head. My wife asked me what happened and I explained it to her. She was shocked as well, but she didn't know him like I did. I told her I needed a bit of time and went to my room. She let me be. Lost, I found myself at my computer. I'm not really sure why I did it, but I found myself checking his email. I knew the passwords he commonly used, so it was hardly an issue to find the right one. I thought perhaps he had friends online who I needed to tell, or maybe I thought I'd find a window into what caused this. I really don't know. If I knew then what I know now, I would have never done what I did. I scrolled through his inbox, looking for familiar names. Joe, I and several friends kept in touch online, and I instantly recognised several of those names in the last few days. The most recently opened email was what looked like a spam email with an attachment and no other information. Curiosity got the better of me, and I opened it. The file itself was a picture, named nothing but a seemingly random string of numbers. It was simply a man, seemingly normal at a glance. But the longer I stared at it, the more disturbed I became. He stood, staring, with a grin, sinister and unsettling, with eyes that were both vacant and focused at the same time. That terrible grin seemed to widen the longer I stared, and for minutes I was fixated at that horrible face, eyes burning as they stared back at me with equal intensity. Finally, I tore my gaze away to find the only other thing in the email, a single word. A word I, I can't repeat, not yet. 
I need to tell my story. I couldn't take the sight of it anymore. I had to close it. The face was still looking at me. I swear I could still feel his grinning stare. As I went to log out of his email and put that horrid thing out of my mind, I noticed the time it arrived. January 23rd, 5.35pm. We were supposed to meet at 6. He likely saw this less than half an hour before he died. For the next several days, I tried to get it out of my mind. I attended my friend's funeral. I tried to go on with my life, but I kept feeling uneasy. Every time I closed my eyes, I felt like someone was watching me. At night, I started to have unsettling nightmares. I couldn't remember much of them when I awoke, but they all had the same elements. That horrible, grinning man. Blood, violence, and death. I couldn't get a good night's sleep. I was struggling at work. I kept feeling tense and on edge. I needed to know what was going on. It was hard to really know what to look for at first. All I had to go on was that image and the single word that accompanied it. Grinning man is hardly a descriptive search and haunted grinning man or cursed grinning man wasn't really any better. Still, I did what I could with my limited resources. I actually found a reference to it, or what I thought was it, on a website dedicated to conspiracies and paranormal things and other things that I'd normally dismiss as utter bullshit. Still, this wasn't natural, and I was willing to try to open my mind to any explanation, since this seemed to defy anything conventional. What I uncovered about this grinning man was that it was an image that seemed to circulate among image boards and forums a few years back. The article said the picture was harmless, if not a bit creepy, though I strongly disagree on the term a bit. But it seemed that something about it, when coupled with a key word that was unknown, could trigger extreme psychotic bouts, irritability, nightmares, and hallucinations. It seemed so utterly stupid, simple text and pixels causing such harm, and yet I was sitting there, realising that I was experiencing those same nightmares, irritability and hallucinations. Joe obviously experienced the psychosis, evidenced by his sudden murder-suicide. I was stunned. I thought it had to be a joke, some kind of bizarre hoax, but I knew there was more to it than that. I knew what I was feeling, and I knew my friend. That picture, and that word. It had to be the key word. What triggers everything? Oh God, was this going to happen to me too? Was I going to kill my wife, and then myself? I started to panic, but my rational mind won over. If it was just paranoia and hallucinations, those couldn't hurt me, right? They only had power if I gave them power. I decided that I would end this, put it out of my mind, rationalise it away each time I felt it. That would be the end of it all. As much as my rational brain helped me through the day, it couldn't protect me at night. My dreams continued to degrade, ending in me waking in the middle of the night, cold sweats and heart pounding. I started taking sleeping pills, though I refused to tell my wife. I didn't want her to worry, though I knew she could tell something was wrong with me. The pills did nothing, though. In fact, they seemed to make my dreams more vivid. I could remember everything when I awoke. Every horrible, bloody detail. That grinning, inhuman face. I found I started sleepwalking. The first night I woke curled in the bathtub, then in the kitchen. Three days later, with a knife in my hand and the bloodied remains of our black lab at my feet. I can't even remember the next things that happened after that. I know I cleaned up our dog, hid him in a trash bag and said he ran off in the night and got lost. I was terrified. I had no idea what to do. I tried to medicate myself heavily. I locked up all the knives in the house. My wife knew there was something terribly wrong, but I refused to say anything. I don't even know if I could at the time. 
The only thing I can still remember clearly was the dreams. I was irate and easily spooked at the littlest of things. I thought it had to just be my nerves from all of this and lack of sleep, but I remembered my friend, the website. I knew I was getting worse. The thing I remember most about the dreams, aside from that horrible grinning man, is the emotions. I felt each death that was inflicted in the dream like it was real. Like it was my own hand disemboweling my friends, my families, and random strangers against my own will. Like each death, each vision of terror he showed me was not just a vision, but my own work. Each horrible death in the dream made him grin a little wider. He wanted me to snap. He wanted me to become exactly what he was showing me. He wanted me to become him. So I come here to tell you this because I'm desperate. I need help. You see, I can't bear the thought of harming my wife, the woman I love most in this world. Yet I know it's inevitable. He's always there, watching and grinning, knowing I'm close to breaking and nudging me ever closer to the edge. I know what he wants. I can't let him have that. I don't know any other way out. I'm reaching out to you in hopes that he'll leave me alone. Maybe if you, the careless reader who I warned away, will give him what he wants, he'll let me be. I have to try. I don't know what else to do. I'm so sorry. I hope you can forgive a man for acting in desperation. It's the moments of the day you've been waiting for. You strip down, out of your restraining clothes, and step into the cold, pale chamber. You turn the knob and feel the water splash against your body, adjusting the temperature to the most optimal setting. A shiver runs down your spine as you feel the worries of your mind melt away, as does the dirt of the daily routine. You take a moment to revel in the warm splashing of the water jets against your back and chest. Soon after, you apply the products. Shampoo, conditioner and body wash, all at your own leisure. You try not to think of all the stressful woes of the time beforehand, nor of all the tasks that still need to be done after. Right now, this time is just for you. It's the most relaxing time of the day. Or it would be, if not for having to wash your face. Such a simple, insignificant task, you think. But when you begin lathering the soap in your hands to apply it to your face, you begin to think of the time it will take you to rinse it off. Three seconds. Five seconds maybe even nine whole seconds. It's the time in which you become fully aware of your unremarkable vulnerability. You're surrounded by walls on all three sides. You cannot see beyond the shower curtain on your only side to freedom. You have no means of defence or anywhere to hide. When you begin rinsing off the soap from your face, you cannot see anything at all. You think about possibly keeping your eyes open during this part so as to not hinder yourself from any possible danger further. But you know that the soap would only trickle down into them, causing you to clamp your eyes shut anyway. For that brief window of time, your mind conjures horrific images of what could possibly be lurking around you, waiting to take advantage of you in your most vulnerable moments. You know there's nothing out there. You were just looking around and there was nothing. It would be silly to think otherwise, right? If that's what you'd like to believe, then sure. However, one of these days, you're going to wipe your eyes clear of soap and water. 
or reach out from behind the curtain to grab your towel to find something that you know was not there before. My shrunken, smiling face staring back at you in the bleached box. My shriveled hand waiting patiently for yours atop your towel. I have numerous ways to instill terror and pain from when you are most vulnerable. But trust me, you have nothing to fear. You just keep doing what you're doing, relaxed and sedated. There's nothing on the other side of the curtain. In any city, in any country, go to any mental institution or halfway house you can get yourself to. When you reach the front desk, ask to view something known as the holder of the voice. The worker may try to hide a brief look of panic, but will eventually compose himself. He will throw you a small, black, unmarked plastic bag and walk away irrationally. You do not have to follow him, but something will bid you to trace his footsteps. You will pass through a dimly lit hallway with panoramic windows for walls. Regardless of the time of day, the outdoors will appear to be dark. Should you look out the windows, you will see only an endless stretch of woods. If you think you see motion in the woods, do not turn. Keep walking up towards the end of the hall. There will be no door, only a blank wall with peeling wallpaper. The worker will tear the wallpaper off just a bit then flee into the shadows. When you inevitably finish tearing the wallpaper, a small, dusty attic room will be revealed. In the centre sit two objects, a small doll and a tape recorder. Both are ancient and coated in dust. If you examine the doll, you will see a small metal crank on it. Wind the crank and the doll will emit a sound somewhat akin to fingernail scratching against wood. Press play on the tape recorder. It will play even if there are no batteries. There will be the muffled sound of a female voice in distress. You will not be able to make out the words. It will go on and on until you press stop. The final decision facing you will be whether or not you should play the two sounds together. The bag given to you will contain two rusted railroad spikes. You know what you will do. The moment you attempt to start both sounds at the same time, the ground will begin to shake and the room around you will begin to crackle and start coming apart. If you were to survive the collapse of the building, you will be haunted by a sound so shrill and grating that should you remain listening to it for even a small amount of time, you shall bleed from the ears until death. Even before that, you feel strongly compelled to impale both of your eardrums with the railroad spikes. Your only hope is to, through the evil sounds piercing the air, nail the doll and tape recorder to the floor where you stand. Should you succeed within the broken tape recorder, you will find a tape. It is unplayable and emanates a buzzing hum if you listen closely. That object is 105 of 538. When the time comes, all held within shall be revealed. In any city, in any country, go to any mental institution or halfway house you can get yourself to. When you reach the front desk, ask to visit someone who calls himself the Holder of Youth. The attendant will choke back a childish giggle and rise from her seat, motioning for you to follow. Do so, but do not show any emotion other than annoyance, for there are creatures watching you, waiting for a chance to erase your mind 
and make you do their foul bidding. The attendant will lead you through the facility, skipping merrily along and turning down hallways at a whim. Do not bother trying to remember the path, for it will soon be irrelevant. After what will feel like hours of walking, she will turn into an empty room and halt abruptly, announcing that you have arrived. Follow her in and shut the door firmly, then move aside. She will wait, rocking gingerly on her heels, then bounce towards the door, opening it with little more than a grin. Through the door, there will be a lush meadow, teeming with vibrancy and life. Follow your guide through the frame and stop when she does. She will then glance around nervously and lean towards you with apprehension in her eyes. She will speak a single, whimsical word, then depart, leaving through the door and closing it. You must make sure to not forget that word. Walk forward with rigid, stoic paces, keeping an angry visage upon your features. The guardians here know you do not belong, but will be too afraid to strike. For now. Continue walking until you reach a ring of flowers and step inside it. They will all wilt suddenly, with the exception of one small portion. Go in that direction, and that direction only, for 44 paces. Then stop, turn to your right, and walk another 44 paces. When you stop for a second time, turn completely around. You should be in a dense, verdant forest. If you are not, then the guardians have mustered their courage, and no power in this place will try to save you. When you arrive, immediately take three steps backward. You should come to rest against a large tree. Vines and branches will snake over your body and hold you there, but do not struggle. No matter how tightly they constrict, you must not show your pain, but keep glaring forward, lest the tree decide to crush you on itself. When the growth stops, several children will burst from the bushes, laughing and playing, oblivious to your presence, and form a ring around the tree. As they begin to dance around it, they will sing in pleasant voices, a silly children's song, making the trees around them shudder with laughter. Whatever you do, do not speak or soften your face, but wait until the children pause and sit to catch their breath. One of them will finally notice you and ask what you are doing there. Tell them that you wish to see father, and they will gasp as one. Should they begin to giggle, then your death will arrive soon by creatures which no words could ever describe. Sternly tell them again that you wish to speak with father, and their leader will hang his head glumly, muttering acquaintances to you. He will stand and walk away, leaving all the others around you. They will begin to speak to themselves and you, but you must not look at them, listen to them, or even think about anything they might say to you. They only seek to break your stoic mask and flee their punishment. If their words should ever cease, then growl at them, stop pouting about it and enjoy yourselves. You must sound as menacing as possible, and they will resume talking. No one knows what happens if they remain silent. When the other child finally arrives, he will sit back down and a tall, wizened figure will emerge from the thicket. He will stare at you, a gaunt, annoyed face that should match your own, and demand to know why you came here of all places. Glare at him and ask, does it truly matter? The figure will sigh darkly and begin a long-winded rant about the follies of youth. Stay silent, or he will not take kindly to interruptions. When he finally winds down, he will ask again why you are here. Ask him, what were they before this? The old man's eyes will flash with understanding, and he will sit on a nearby stone and begin to speak. He will tell you in every possible detail what they were in a time before time, when there was still a shred of goodness within what they kept. 
He will explain, with a heavy voice, the karma times, and tell you of the events that sparked their fall. Every slight, every delusion, every crushed dream will be laid bare by his words. As the old man speaks, the lush green around you will give way to blackened, dead soil, rotting trees, and foul, half-rotting vegetation. Do not change your expression, and hold your gaze on the old man. The story will end with, see what they have done to my children. The small figures that sat around you will now be festering corpses, all eyeing you with gleams of sadness in their putrescent faces, begging for release. They will all stand and trot toward you, with their father telling you that their hunger must be sated. Now, in your loudest voice, scream the word you were told when you arrived. Should you have forgotten or mispronounce it in any way, then you will spend the rest of eternity as the dead children's meal. Speak it correctly, and they should all fall to the ground, clutching their ears shut, and the constricting briars from the tree will shatter. Take the largest piece of wood that you can find, run toward the old man, and stab him in the neck with it. As he chokes on his own blood, he will hold a single rose aloft. Take it from his hand, as darkness will surround you, forcing you to choke and die like him. When your lungs feel as though they shall burst, you will find yourself at the door to the place you call home, gasping for air and clutching the flower in your clammy hand. That rose is object 87 of 538, forlorn remembrance. It stands for the purity that once was and never shall be again. Sight can always be very elusive. It can trick the mind into believing that something is somewhere when it is somewhere else, or when it doesn't even exist. It can provide unnatural illusions and hallucinations to weird out the beholder. But I can tell you right now, this isn't the case. I'm not insane. I'm not dreaming. My mind is not fucked. This is real. I swear to you, it's real. I can't stress how much this has ached me. I can't think straight. That thing, it follows me everywhere. It's in the trees, the bushes, the beds, the dresses, the TVs, the fields, the chairs, the minds, the eyes, everywhere. I don't know how to go about it. Well, I'm starting to ramble about knowledge unknown. Let me introduce myself. My name is Ryder. I live in Arizona, a very secluded part. Large house, lots of fields. We are farm animals. I've never been the farming type of kid. I was born in Seattle, raised until five, then abandoned by my mother. My father raised me and my brother with care taught us new things that my mother hadn't known. We had very good internet. We were a technological family. We knew the ups and downs of everything. I am now 17, my brother 15. Nobody else knows about this. Nobody. A few weeks ago, I was out late, checking on all of the animals. A flashlight in hand, my pajamas on. I was just about ready for bed. A breath just flew around my entire body. Just a giant air wave. It didn't feel like it came from the sky, but from an actual living organism. It knew I was there. It had watched me for quite some time. I would catch it in a glimpse, but never enough to draw conclusions. As I felt that breath, I made a complete 360 turn, inspecting everything around me. And when I saw nothing, I fled to the house. I buried myself under the covers, and as I gasp for air, I feel a finger rush from my lower back to my neck. And with the softest, most melodic voice I have ever heard in my life, it whispers, Our secret is kept dear, for I was never here. And it is gone. I snap to reality. I'm outside. I'm in the same spot I was before. What the hell just happened? Without thought, 
I take a 360 turn, inspecting everywhere. I spot something. I stop my turn and look closer. I see the back of someone. I check it out and I bring my eyes upon the head. It's abnormal. Its size is much larger than my own. My vision becomes much clearer and I see the creature. With a flashlight in hand, my pyjamas on, just about ready for bed, it turns its head towards me without moving its body. With its mouth, it slowly mouths the words while the sounds are right in my eardrums as if there are two of them whispering right next to me. I've always been right here. When I was little, my grandmother used to tell me to beware the button man. I can still hear her croaky old voice, forbidding me from smiling at the button man. She was always warning me not to stay out when it was dark and to go to bed on time or else I ran the risk of a visitation from the button man. I never knew what she meant or who the button man was. I just presumed he was some made up boogeyman, conjured to frighten kids living in the northeast of England. I mean, there's not much that would frighten a kid brought up on an estate, but the button man came close. She even had a poem for him. It went something like, Beware the button man and his button smile. If you grin at him, he may stay a while. Anyway, she died last week, and when I was sorting through her stuff, I found a ton of old junk. You know the sort of stuff you'd imagine finding in the hoard of an 87-year-old? But one thing really stuck out. In an old oak box was this collection of drawings, the paper all yellowed. There were other things in there too, but the drawings are what really stood out. They were kids' drawings, crayons, scribbled stick figures, standing by a simplistic square house. The characters in the scenes were labelled as well, like all kids do. There was Mum, Dad, me, and Buttons. A shiver went up my spine reading that, and instantly I remembered another of my grandma's poems. Beware the button man, be back before your tea. For if you stay out too late, his button eyes you'll see. Most people wouldn't understand why a drawing had such an effect, but if you'd seen it, you'd understand that despite everything seeming like any normal childish doodle, the towering tall dark figure labelled Buttons was different. Unlike the others, Buttons was scribbled in black, with a smile of navy dots and most disturbingly, inhumanly extended arms. In the first few drawings, the towering Buttons figure is small and distant, standing atop a hill, but the other drawings show him getting closer. A small girl labelled me, being drawn with a sad face, on the sheet that had buttons standing behind her. If you're disturbed, then I don't blame you. I was. So much so that I took the drawings to my mum, who thought they were sweet, a call back to simpler times. When asked who Buttons was, she said he was her imaginary friend, that he stole Buttons from her clothes and lived beneath her bed. Terrifying to most, I'm sure, but my mother was still dazzled by the trip down memory lane. Her nostalgia blinded her to the absolute creepiness of everything she had just told me. That all changed when she looked at one of the drawings though. I could see in her face something wasn't right. Her eyes swelled with worry and a cold sweat began to run down her head. In all the years of my life, not once had I seen my mother look so concerned troubled, maybe even fearful. What is it? I asked, but she said nothing, just claiming that she felt a little unwell. When I looked at the drawing that had caused my mum to become so unnerved, I saw nothing exceptionally abnormal. Then I spotted it. A small stick figure, standing by the little girl labelled me, who I now presumed was my mother. 
the small character who was absent from the other drawings was labelled Iris. I asked my mother who the little stick figure was, and despite her reluctance, she eventually answered. It's my sister, she said. Your auntie, Iris. I'm not sure if it was confusion or disbelief that I felt when she said that, but I struggled to find a reply. This was the first time I had ever heard of having an auntie. How come I've never met her? I asked, not ready for the answer that followed. She died, Mum said in a low, trembling voice. I asked what happened, but my mum refused to tell me. She just said something awful and begged me to never speak of Iris or the drawings again. Being a total mummy's girl, I didn't think twice. I agreed to never speak of it again, but that did not stop my curiosity desiring to know more about this mysterious auntie of mine. So I did what any ordinary millennial does. I googled her, scoured the internet, but found nothing. I typed in the button man and the same again, nothing. So I returned to where this whole mystery began, my grandmother's attic hoard. I hoped to cleave something, some shred of information about my auntie, an article or a diary perhaps, something. What I found was a pink notebook wedged behind some old frames. The notepad was cheap looking and it had stick-on flowers glued to the front cover. The book was clearly my mother's, as it had her name written on the back. It must have been hers when she was a lot older, as it was full of poems. They weren't literary masterpieces by any means, but the poems were written well enough to not be the work of a crayon drawing child. Reading on one of the poems, my heart sank, and a terrible sense of dread fell upon me. This is what the poem said. Beware the button man, who lives beneath the bed. If you speak his name, you'll surely end up dead. But if you know his secret, then all you have to do is give him someone else, so he does not take you. My heart sank reading that line. What kind of children's poem was this? Who would ever tell kids such a thing? Why would my mum write these? Those are just a handful of the questions that troubled my thoughts. Then as if by chance, a slip of paper fell from between the pages of poetry. With anticipation for what this new clue might unveil, I reached down and plucked the folded square up. In my fingers the sheet unravelled, and though old and rigid the paper appeared to have stood the test of time. My blood ran cold as I looked upon the simplistic drawing of a family and a girl's imaginary friend. But unlike all the others, this one showed buttons, standing in the distance, with a sack dotted and dripping in red, cast over his shoulder. But what is most disturbing is the girly stick figure labelled Iris was gone and the stick figure drawing of my mum was waving buttons off. In any city, in any country, go to any mental institution or halfway house you can get yourself to. When you reach the front desk, ask the receptionist if you can see the one who calls herself the holder of pain. The receptionist will say that he has no idea who you speak of, but will slide a card across the desk to you with a room number on it. Take the card while replying apologetically, I must be in the wrong place then, and ascend the stairs that may or may not have been there before. As you wander the upcoming halls in search of her room, you will hear the most beautiful singing you have ever heard. Should the singing ever stop, whisper, please continue, it's beautiful. However, the return of the singing is the last thing you want. If it does, 
you may calmly leave the building and tell your loved ones goodbye. You will be dead by morning. Should the silence persist, continue to the room shown on the card. Quietly enter it. An average looking blonde haired woman wearing glasses will be sitting in the centre of the bare room with her back turned to you. A pool of blood will have collected at her feet. Approach her and embrace her. Mind yourself though, the closer you get to her, the more pain and despair you will feel wash over you. You must continue in spite of this, lest you weep yourself to death. Hold on to her until she begins to cry and ask her, where does their pain come from? She will smile weakly and respond, their love. She will then hold out her hand and you will notice a ring on her finger. Delicately take the ring from her finger, kiss the back of her hand and leave. The ring is object 212, 538. Only you will see that the most painful thing in the world can be love. The mind, the hollow void of your skull and electricity that keeps you alive, based on ever-changing but firm instincts. The very mass that is you, your consciousness all in one small, fragile pack of tissue. But as we know, electricity can be manipulated. You can be manipulated. Everything you know, say, think and do is all electricity. Like an overgrowing photography collection, everything passes through the brain to be confirmed and then remembered. As an old saying goes, you forget a thousand things every day. So if the brain was such a good firewall, why would you still see shapes in the middle of the night? eerie noises haunting you, only to be confirmed as something else. <laughs> well, it is simple. Why are humans afraid of snakes, storms and war? We learned our lesson. We found that these things kill us, and we should stay far away from any source of these events. So as for these shapes, we learned our lesson. We found that these things can also kill us, just as the previous threats. What phobia is pulling the threads, telling your brain to be wary of something you are told you are making up? All the studies, all the facts, and yet you still fear your midnight hallucinations. It is less simple than many would like to prove, but can be summed up with one word coexistence. Just because humans forgot these beings exist does not mean that they have not slaughtered us in the past. They certainly have not gone away. These stealthy beasts have taken kids who were declared missing. They look like anything they can copy. That is why human shapes and beast-like shapes both appear. You forget a thousand things every day. Don't forget again. Sixteen, thirty-five, 23 April 2051 So, uh, I fucked up hard, and, well, I'm fucked. <coughs> Hang on, let me turn that off. I, I want to die in peace, for God's sake! <laughs> <laughs> Low pressure alarm muted. Low O2 alarm muted. Where was I? Oh yeah, 
So this is going to be my last, well, everything. Well, because of a fucking drill. Who knew that a drill could cause an astronaut to get flung towards the sun? It's ironic, really. <laughs> I always loved the sun. That's why I was on the Solaris station for my research about the sun, as that's why the Solaris orbits the sun. So I'm guessing when I transmit this, the CESE would want to know what the fuck actually happened. Well, guys, I was out on my spacewalk to do repair and do maintenance on a few solar cells on the starboard side of the Solaris. Like normal, I used the drill to unbolt a cell to repair it and my tether must have got caught or something because then I felt a thud through me. So something had to have shattered and flew towards my visor. My ears popped, so something must have gone, gone fucking through. I... I can't, I can't remember anything else. <laughs> my sun visor must be fucked as I can feel my face has been burnt and I can feel a blob of blood under my Snoopy cap. I have been turning myself away from the sun with the air coming out my glove because... Well, if I didn't, I would be blinder than the Canadian astronaut who went blind during a spacewalk from our history books. O2, tank, 11%, remaining, alarm, active. Fuck! Fuck! Fuck it, fuck! Fuck! Damage detected. Ah! Damage ah! report. Left glove. Ah! Left arm. Ah! Suit breach detected. Damage 31%. Percent. Increasing backfill of N2. CO2 filter damaged. Damage report. Error. Unresponsive. Bollocks. Had a fucking paddy and now fucked myself harder. Shit! Well, at least I can say I went down with a fight. With my spacesuit. I buggered it, but I still had a fight. And Fucked it up more. <laughs> I'm pretty close to the sun now. I can feel it. I'm going to transmit this now before it's too late. Transmission from suit dot log to Sol Station. Searching for Sol Station signal. Good. I want the last moments of my life to be used for good so CESE knows what happened and that I haven't just fucked up and going to die and no one knows why. CO2 level 1% updated 2% O2 tank 5% remaining N2 tank 4% Remaining. I'm starting to feel sleepy, I think. The CO2's getting high. I think humans pass out at uh, 4%? Anyway, let's stop thinking about the inevitable. And, uh, um. Sixteen thirty eight. Sixteen forty two. CO two level three per cent. O two tank ten point five per cent remaining. N two tank five percent remaining backfill terminated n2 below five percent emergency oxygen backfill engaged heat alarm suit 97 degrees centigrade 1644 
shit. I must have fallen asleep. Crap. It's really fucking hot. Mum and Dad, this is the last time you will ever hear my voice. And I want to say that I love you. I hope I made you proud. Alex, my love, I love you so much with all my heart and I'm sorry to leave you like this and I hope you and Doug, the besties, even without me, were still a family and I, I love you and all, but I want to see the sun. Sixteen forty five. Medical alert. Astronaut PS Beck unresponsive. Heart rate one four five BPM. Overheat detected. Heat one hundred ninety nine degrees centigrade. Suit auto shutdown. Starting two percent complete. Sixteen fifty eight transmission sent medical alert astronaut P S back unresponsive zero BPM duration less than five minutes astronaut P S back life status deceased. Seventeen O three Severe Heat Damage Heat Error Above four hundred degrees centigrade. Seventeen O five Suit and Audio Log Transmission Fail Zero Percent Cent. Shut down complete. Goodbye, Solaris Station. In any city, in any country, go to any mental institution or halfway house you can get yourself to. When you reach the front desk, ask with no hesitation to visit someone who calls himself the Holder of Darkness. The worker will mock you, but you have to stay as calm as possible. Keep asking him until he stops denying and withdraws from his counter to guide you through the corridors. As his behaviour changes radically, stay on guard, for if you start hearing one single tiny sinister hiss, you should turn around and flee as far as you can, covering your ears, because the time was bad. If you do not escape in time, the faint sound will turn into a dreadful growling that will soon merge into a continuous shriek of sheer pain until madness floods you and leaves you to die in deafening agony. If the warden remains silent, he will lead you to a closed door with neither handles nor lock. As he pushes it open effortlessly, you will see an ascending, winding staircase, which can't possibly lead to any upper floor of the establishment. The door will close behind you, and you will not be able to push it back. Past this point, climb and do not turn back, or you will fall into a bottomless pit waiting for living prey to chew upon. Do not count the steps, for knowing how many there are will drive you to insanity. One will then creak, and at that point, you should stop. Another door should appear on your left. If it is on your right, then pray for a swift passing. Enter slowly into the room, and a blinding, obscuring darkness shall descend upon you. You will be required to walk straight forward, for straying even slightly will lead you to be devoured by the roaming and unknown creatures observing you 
with blinded and purulent eyes. You will know you have arrived when coldness grips you. At that very moment, freeze, or you will die by the hands of the holder who is standing right in front of you. In complete darkness, even closing your eyes will not prevent you from his horrid appearance. It will form into your mind as the most outrageous monster ever conceived, and madness will try to creep into your brain as worms over a decayed corpse. His fulminating breath and constant mumbling would be enough to make you cry, but be advised not to utter anything louder than a weeping, or you might wake what must not be awakened. The only question you will be able to whisper without being torn apart will be, what do they fear? You will feel movements all around you as shudders animate your opponents. You will hear what nameless and incurable diseases will strike the world if they were to be frightened. The countless terrors their own fright will unleash on those with a weaker mind than theirs. Amidst the atrocious enumeration of the endless sores the world will suffer, you might hear the simplest, almost ridiculous, yet implicable and certain truth they all fear. Do not move again. When your head is about to implode, it will stop. If you are still able to move, you will find a door in front of you, which leads you outside of the ward. There, in the open, in the grass, a broken hourglass will wait for you. You are free to pick it up. It is object 13 of 538. Your knowledge of their fears is up to you to share, but you may not want to use it as a weapon against them. It was a quiet Friday evening, and eight-year-old Sarah had just returned from school. Elated by the lack of homework for that weekend, she wasted no time in pulling out her half-finished art project, a small wooden cottage made up of ice cream sticks from under her bed. There was a lot of cutting to be done though, and despite having been told not to use the penknife without parental supervision, she quickly took it from her father's work desk and proceeded to trim the edges of the ice cream sticks. Due to the lack of experience in using a penknife, it quickly slipped from her grip and left a huge, bloody gash on her left arm. Daddy! Daddy! Sarah's voice rang out from her second floor bedroom. I hurt my arm! It's bleeding really badly! Sarah's cries of pain were the first thing Carl heard as he entered through the front door. As he drew in a breath to yell out a call of reassurance, a figure outside the window caught his eye. It was a man holding a large rake and he was heading right towards the back door of the house. Ignoring the panic welling up in his body, Carl quickly closed the front door quietly and hurried towards the kitchen, which was where the back door was located. Taking great care not to make any noise, he pulled a knife from its holder and positioned himself right next to the doorway. Don't worry, baby. Don't worry. I'll protect you. Carl felt his heart rate quicken and his palms sweat as the footsteps outside drew closer. Don't worry, baby. Daddy will protect you. The door finally swung open and Carl sprang into action. Clamping his free hand over the intruder's mouth, he slammed his foot at the backs of the intruder's legs. As the intruder toppled over to his knees, Carl quickly seized the chance and swung the knife down onto the intruder's neck slicing the neck wide open from ear to ear. Panting heavily from adrenaline and exhaustion, Carl pushed away the lifeless, blood-soaked body in disgust. The once pristine walls were now splattered with blood that pooled all around his feet. Daddy! What's all that noise? What's going on? Sarah's yells had increased in panic levels the noise made during the fight, Sighing softly, Carl stepped away from the blood puddles and hurried towards the stairs. Hold on, baby. I'm coming. Daddy! Daddy! Sarah's voice had evolved into a loud shrill of panic and fear. Hold on, baby. Daddy's coming. 
As Carl emerged onto the landing, he pushed open the half-open door to Sarah's room. Hey, baby. How many times have I told you not to call me that? Sarah groaned as she swung her wheelchair towards the door. What took you so- She froze in mid-sentence as she finally turned towards Carl. Her irritation quickly dissipated and in its place was pure fear. Who- Who are you? She whispered in horror. A small grin crept over Carl's face as he stepped into the bedroom, brandishing the bloody knife by his side. Daddy's home. The footprints started in the snow, coming from the road. They led through the pristine snow and into the large spruce tree in the front yard. Tiny. Certainly human. I examined the tree from afar. I wanted to investigate, but not with the kids with me. The bus finally arrives. I follow the tiny steps until I'm an arm's length or two away from where they end. I keep my distance, but circle around the tree. No more prints, just the set going in. As I start to take a step towards the thick spruce, the branches rustle. I nearly fall on my ass, so I frantically back up. Nothing emerges, nothing makes a sound. My brain pushes the issue. It keeps telling me that there has to be a kid in there. It had to have been dropped off and then wandered into the tree. I grab a long stick from the edge of the driveway. I lift a few of the needle branches with it from a distance. It looked like something the size of a toddler's been rolling and writhing in the dead needles. Nothing was there, no animals, no kids. I went back inside to start breakfast for myself. While standing at the counter, I looked out of the window and saw a streak of brown hurry past near the windowsill. I leapt to the window but couldn't find anything in the yard. I was in the shower when I heard it. It was a quiet whining or groaning. I stopped the water and listened. It seemed to be close, maybe just under the little bathroom window. After climbing up on an overturned wastebasket, I pulled the window open. A single line of little human prints along the perimeter of the house. The prints led straight to our decorative pond. There was a hole broke through the ice. I didn't even bother to dry off. I grabbed my robe and ran out into the snow barefoot and soaking wet. I slid across the frozen patio. I almost went into the freezing water. I looked around my yard and saw a large black cat with an odd stride moving down towards the creek. After some slipping and sliding, I made it into the house and stand by a heat register to thaw out my feet. I called my wife. I assumed she had to be playing a joke on me. Hey, what do you need? Not much. Did you notice any weird footprints around the house on your way out this morning? What, like El Chupacabra? I love my wife, but she can't lie. I laughed at her joke and told her to never mind. There was a few moments of silence, followed by the kind of scream that only comes from a kid. The sudden noise dazed me for a moment. Once I realised what was happening, I ran to the front door. I jerked it open as fast as my arms would move. A lump of fur about the size of a three-year-old was sitting on my porch. It had a long tail and pointy cat-like ears. The scream stopped as soon as the door was cracked open. Like a teenager trying to sneak out of the house, I locked the storm door as quietly and slowly as I could. The lock clicked into place. The head started slowly turning with a twist of the body. What stared at me wasn't a cat's face. It was a face I'd only seen in photographs. Those little blue eyes, the same eyes from that picture on the wall at my neighbour's house. The eyes stared through the glass at me. It licked its lips with a black tongue and formed its lips into an innocent smile. Then came the sweet laughter of a child. It wasn't just coming from the... 
thing. <laughs> it was coming from every nook and cranny of my home. It felt like it was coming from inside of me too. It pressed its face up against the glass of the storm door. Let me in. It's cold out here. I slammed the door, bolted the deadbolt. I even used the little chain at the top. I leaned against the door and tried not to vomit. The only place I'd ever seen that face was in a picture on my neighbor's mantle. I started away from the door and heard a tapping on the glass in the family room. It was standing on the flower box, rubbing its face against the window. It's me, Tony, echoed through the house. My stomach rejected everything I'd eaten, all over the entryway and part of the family room. The laughing started again. It was loud enough that I felt like it was shaking my bones. It stopped abruptly and I heard the sound of the storm door lock being opened. I ran for the back door. There it sat on the washer. I couldn't move. I tried to run, but nothing worked. Its eyes rolled back into its head and its head started to nod up and down in long swings. The furry body shook violently for a few seconds. Tony's face swayed around with it, then began to stare at the ceiling as a circle of old jagged teeth emerged from the mess of fur. I almost threw up again when the wet clicks started. Every click brought a new yellow eye out of the thicket of fur. Dozens of yellow eyes opened. Their pupils bounced around like they were analysing every little detail of its surroundings. It hissed, it lunged at me, something clicked inside of me, I ran. I grabbed a skillet on my way through the kitchen. It was on my heels. I turned and threw the skillet as hard as I could down at it. It slumped on the floor. I grabbed my snow shovel from the door and stuffed it into the living room closet that's under the steps. I pushed the couch up against the door. I sat on the floor against the other end of the couch and laid my head back. I opened my eyes and saw the circle of teeth pointed at me from the ceiling. All eyes on me. It dropped from the ceiling. I rolled out of the way. It landed with a thud. My hand was burning, but I was scrambling back to the kitchen. I stopped at the island, turned, and saw it standing in the doorway. Little Tony's face was staring right through me. The left side started to drop like wax slowly melting. It quickly became unrecognisable and started to pull back up into place. The face that came back wasn't the matching half of Tony's face. It was mine. I grabbed the closest thing to me, a sea salt grinder. I threw it as hard as I could at it. The salt grinder shattered into a hail of glass and salt. It hissed, it twisted, those yellow eyes swirling around its body. Before I knew what was happening, I had run back to the mudroom. I grabbed the bag of rock salt I use for the icy sidewalks and I ran back into the kitchen. I dumped the entire bag on the thing. It screeched a horrible cry. I don't know what it was, but I know the sound of agony. It sounded like it was being seared to death. When I swept up the salt, there weren't any traces of the monster. I had bandaged up the gash on my hand. I I guess it got me a little. I'd made an effort to have everything back together by the time the kids got off the bus. When my wife was giving them their baths, she called me in to look at something. On the right shoulder blade, both boys had the same mark. A little circle that looked like it had been perforated right into their skin. Then I remembered something I'd brushed off earlier. One of the boys came up to me while I was cooking dinner and asked when he could go outside and play with Tony again. Before I covered them up for the night, 
I gave them their hugs, and when they told me that they loved me, they looked back up at me with yellow eyes. I did a double take. Their eyes were back to brown. I'm not sure what will come of this, but I needed to warn the rest of you. Beware of lost children. You never know what you have to lose. It had been a long, dull day at work. James fumbled for his keys in the pouring rain, dropping a few dollars from his pocket in the process. Didn't matter, he just wanted to get inside and get some well-deserved rest, even though he knew sleep would only evade him. Sleep. The word seemed so foreign to him. Otherworldly, even. How long had it been? Three days? He couldn't keep this up. He needed to sleep, but he knew as soon as his head felt the soft embrace of his pillow and his eyelids closed over his bloodshot eyes, his fatigue would leave him. He had medication, both legal and illegal, that he took frantically and fruitlessly to achieve at least a small taste of rest. The insomnia had begun to control his life. James popped a few pills down his throat, not caring about the side effects, and slammed his head onto the pillow. His eyes closed, and he was plunged into an inky darkness. His mind refused to empty itself. He tried to concentrate, to forget about the real world, and slip away into the darkness, but he couldn't. He suddenly had the urge to watch some TV, to get something to eat. Had he forgotten to brush his teeth? Yes, he had. James dragged himself out of his bed and shuffled hazily to the bathroom. He lazily dragged the red electric toothbrush over his teeth, then rinsed in the sink. As he looked up into the mirror, he stared into his reflection. A scruffy and uneven beard had begun to sprout up on his face. He didn't like it. James whirled around to locate his razor. Had he misplaced it? It wasn't in the shower where he usually kept it. He searched the entire bathroom, and even checked down the narrow hallway outside the bathroom door. It wasn't like him to misplace things, especially trivial objects such as a razor. James believed in the simple philosophy of a place for everything, and everything in its place. He scratched his head, went back into the bathroom, and gasped. He wasn't sure exactly why he gasped, or why he was so startled by what he saw. The razor that he had been searching for had been on the sink the entire time. Or had it? No, he thought. It hadn't been there. I would have seen it. I should have seen it. Shrugging it off, James decided he didn't have the patience to shave anyway. What he did need, however, was a nice, hot shower. That would surely help him to relax, to clear his mind. The water was soothing, if not completely intoxicating. James closed his eyes and experienced the closest thing to sleep he had achieved in the past three days. The water kissed the tip of his nose as he slowly began to drift off. Just as he began to lose himself, the water became warmer. Not a substantial change in temperature by any means, just a tad hotter than it should have been. James paid no attention to it. He just figured that it was some kind of faulty plumbing. Besides, he was far too relaxed to open his eyes now. He then heard the ever so subtle squeaking of the knob that controls the temperature of the water, followed by the intense burning of the hot water that ricocheted off his unsuspecting face. He cursed and flung himself back, desperately reaching for the knob to turn the smouldering water off. The knob had been turned all the way to the side, labelled with a bright red letter H. Insomnia was a bitch, that was no question. A fickle, uncaring, heartless bitch. James was confused and disorientated, and his face had been slightly burnt by the scalding water. After he had gotten dressed, he glanced at his bedside clock. It read 3.22am. Realising that there was no way he was getting any sleep, James went back into the bathroom and stared into the mirror once again. 
His eyes, which were normally a deep blue, were now a tired grey. Thick red veins could be seen running through both sides of his retinas. His pupils were enlarged, as if he had done some kind of hallucinogen. James stood there quietly, examining his features in the mirror for a little while. He occasionally made strange faces at himself, twisting his features and squinting his tired eyes. He then brought his face close to the mirror, so his nose was rubbing up against the glass. Just to be silly, James lowered his voice to a menacing growl. Who are you? He rasped, not taking his face away from the mirror. His reflection blinked. James yelped and flew back. That hadn't happened. He was just tired, that's all. He would have been foolish to think otherwise. But he couldn't help but be terrified to look back into the mirror, to see what horrible, disfigured monster was waiting for him to get up off the floor. But when he finally worked up the guts to look, all he saw was himself. James noticed something, though. Hadn't the door to the bathroom been closed when he first came in? He thought so, although he couldn't be certain. His brain was fried. He needed to rest. His mind had certainly been playing tricks on him. As he turned his back on the mirror, he heard a noise. A scratching sound coming from directly behind him. The sound resembled the screech of nails on a chalkboard. As he turned around, he saw that there was a long, thin scratch running up the side of the mirror. A sharp pinch of pain pulls from James's right index finger. His fingernail had been cut and gnarled, as if he had been scraping away at something. It was the mirror, wasn't it? It was causing all of the confusion and all of the sleepless nights. Every time he turned his back on it, something strange happened. Something bizarre. James bolted into the bathroom and stared into his reflection again. He made many sudden movements in a desperate attempt to psych out whatever was hiding behind the mirror. Nothing abnormal happened. James was extremely frightened to turn around, but he knew that he had no choice but to do so sooner or later. He slowly turned his body, but didn't break eye contact with whatever was looking at him behind his reflection, mimicking him. When James finally looked away from the mirror, everything was silent. For ten whole seconds he stood there, waiting for something horrendous to fly out of the glass and gobble him up. But, for the longest time, nothing did. Then an ear-shattering wham broke the silence. He whirled round to inspect what exactly had made such a loud noise. There was a large crack in the centre of the mirror. It appeared as if someone had taken their fist and slammed it against the glass. Once again, another shooting pain ran up James's right hand, this time more intense than the last. As he looked down at his hand, it had been cut in several places around his knuckles and was bleeding immensely. He instinctively ran to clean the wound, completely forgetting about the mirror. James wrapped his fist in a few paper towels and pressed down in a desperate attempt to stop the crimson liquid from flowing out of his hand. It took around five minutes, but the cut suddenly stopped bleeding. After the bleeding ended, James remembered the mirror. He sprinted up his staircase, stubbing his toe on one of the stairs in the process. He whirled around the corner and down the hallway towards his bathroom, his heart beating in his throat. Once he arrived inside his bathroom, he fell back into the corner and gasped for breath. There was blood smeared all over the mirror, as if someone had squirted it and splattered it everywhere. On the ground was a long, jagged shard of glass, which was also dripping a familiar red liquid. A small puddle of blood was accumulating under James's now lifeless body. His throat had been slit open. Well, what do you think of this one, George? They said they found small amounts of marijuana in his basement, Private Investigator Paul Kite said, while he gazed grimly at the gruesome scene. Private George Henderson chuckled and said, Mary Jane doesn't do this to people, you know that. 
I found at least ten different brands of sleeping pills in his medicine cabinet downstairs. Ever see the side effects for those things? Anxiety, hallucinations, paranoia, etc. I bet this poor guy just took one too many pills. Private Kite frowned as he looked at the smashed mirror covered in dry blood. He could have sworn that, for a second, he saw a different man in there, a different face than his. His face was sullen and expressionless. It was a man, no doubt of that, with extremely bloodshot eyes. The reflection's face took a slight red tint to it, as if it had been burned by something. Kite rubbed his eyes and stared back into the mirror. He saw nothing but his own reflection. He squinted and got close to the blood-stained glass, so that the tip of his nose was almost touching it. As he stared at his reflection, it blinked. Samantha sighed loudly. Today absolutely sucked on practically every conceivable level. She was tired, she was in pain, and worst of all, she was in a doctor's office, which was probably the absolute worst place she ever wanted to be in. When she was eight years old, Sam's paediatrician was arrested for taking videos of his examinations, an event which forever destroyed her trust in the men in white. Throughout the next seven years of her life, the girl had only been to the doctor twice, when she needed her immunizations update, and when she broke her wrist in PE. Otherwise, she avoided them like the plague, even going so far as to pass up joining the volleyball team, because that required a sports physical. Samantha kept telling herself that, unless she was dying or something, she'd never see another doctor again. Unfortunately, reality had other plans for her. Last night was supposed to be the party to end all parties, her best friend Lucy's parents were out of town for the weekend and, just like any other girl her age, she just had to make the best of it. A few dozen texts later, the house filled up with guests, the older of whom bought plenty of booze to go around. Sam had the time of her life, catching up with old friends, playing video games she'd never heard of, and chatting up a few boys she deemed cuter than average, one of whom had even left with her number, but who knew if he'd ever call. Still, all good things eventually came to an end. When dawn struck, most of the guests had already left. Sam stayed behind, fully intending to help Lucy with the clean-up, but as the alcohol rush wore off, it was quickly replaced by a sensation previously unfamiliar to the teenager, one that the older kids commonly referred to as a hangover. For the next day or so, Samantha kept throwing up while fighting a headache only comparable to having a knife stuck into her frontal lobe. She took some aspirin and drank lots of water, which is what Lucy had advised her to do, but it was useless. The headache only seemed to be getting worse. Under her best friend's watchful eye, the girl ended up struggling through the pain for another day until it got to the point where she could barely even stand up. Since she'd promised her parents that she wouldn't touch a drop during the party, going home with the hangover of the millennium is not an option. Like it or not, Sam had to call her GP and ask for advice. The doctor's words? It could be alcohol poisoning. You need to get to the hospital. Just great. Lucy, who'd kept her drink just fine, ended up driving her best friend to the hospital and setting up her appointment. Soon enough, Sam found herself in an examination room, waiting for the doctor to come. Her headache was still there, but at least she wasn't vomiting anymore. Her nausea was replaced by extreme fatigue, which was only natural considering how she hadn't had a blink of sleep for two days and two nights, and one of those nights was spent partying. Honestly, Samantha felt like she could fall asleep right then and there, if not for the goddamn headache tearing her mind apart. The girl rubbed her forehead, but that didn't provide even momentary relief. She assumed that she was pretty close to passing out, but tried to convince herself that the doctor would give her something and she'd be on her way, without the need for hospitalisation or anything of that sort. Honestly, that would have made the worst day of her life all the more horrible. Eventually, Sam's thoughts were interrupted by a few loud knocks, which echoed throughout the mostly empty examination room. A moment later, the door opened to reveal the doctor who presumably would be conducting her checkup. The girl had to admit he was actually a bit of a looker. His short, neatly trimmed hair struck the perfect balance between blonde and brown, and his hipsterish glasses actually looked quite good on his face, which wasn't something she could say about most of her friends with eyewear like that. 
Samantha lowered her head a bit, instinctively looking at his hands to check for any rings. That only made the pounding headache even worse, the pain slicing through her brain and causing her to moan out and press her hand against her forehead. Well, that didn't sound good, the doctor chuckled, approaching his patient as he glanced at his chart in his hands. I'd scold you for underage drinking, but something tells me that's kind of the last thing you want to hear right now. Yeah, Samantha sighed. Ordinarily, she would have come up with some creative quip to show off her impeccable sense of humour. But at the moment, the girl was way too tired and in way too much pain to come up with anything of the sort. Right, right, I'll save it for later. He smiled, reaching into his pocket and pulling out a small pen light. Next, the man placed his hand on the back of Sam's head, pulling it back and pointing the light at her lips. Open wide. The girl rolled her eyes and complied, her vocal cords giving off a faint ah sound. That was really all she could muster without throwing up. Good, good, he commented, looking inside her throat. What exactly was so good about her situation, Sam would never learn. I can see you've kept yourself hydrated. Your body is on its way to recovery. Another day of rest and you should be fine. I can't rest. Headache. The girl motioned towards her head, closing her mouth despite the fact that the pen light was still pointed at it. She just wanted to get something for her head and be on her merry way as quickly as possible. Samantha wished she could somehow relate that urgency to the doctor, but all her body could produce were grunts and slow motion movements. I assume aspirin doesn't help. Have you tried ibuprofen or naproxen? The man asked. She shook her head slowly. I see. Well, if aspirin did nothing, chances are pills wouldn't have been able to help either. Let's try a shot. I've got something that might just be able to help. Oh great, a shot. As if just being at the doctor's office wasn't bad enough. Samantha absolutely despised shots with all her heart, even more than she hated doctors. Sure, one could make the argument that everybody hated shots, but the young girl really had a passionate hatred for them to the point where they had to hold her down, kicking and screaming, in order to update her immunizations a few years back. Still, Sam was way too tired and way too much pain to argue at all, so she just resorted to her fate, with a grunt just loud enough to inform the doctor that she wasn't happy about this development. The girl watched the man in white as he opened one of the medical cabinets next to the table she was sitting on, then retrieved the ordinary items one would use when administering an injection, a rubber band, a bottle of alcohol, a piece of cotton, and of course, a packaged syringe complete with a needle that looked to her as if it was made for elephants, despite the fact that it was probably just a centimetre or two long. Alongside all of that, the man picked up a small bottle with an etiquette of natin containing a transparent yet somewhat muddy liquid. He threw all the items into a small kidney-shaped tray and brought it to the girl, placing it nearby. Lie down, he instructed her. Samantha sighed. Do I need to? she asked. At this point, she was so tired that she wasn't sure she could even stand up afterwards, especially if the medicine helped with her headache. The doctor's silence answered her question, and with another grunt, she pulled her bare feet up onto the table and lay down, placing her head on the rather uncomfortable pillow. The man took her hand by the wrist, turning it around and running a finger across her veins which were clearly visible through her pale skin. Sam averted her gaze and closed her eyes, feeling her nausea returning. The fear of the shot made everything that much worse for her, and it didn't help that the doctor seemed to be taking his time in tying the uncomfortable rubber band around her biceps and selecting the appropriate vein for the injection. Every second felt like an hour to the poor girl, and with each passing moment she felt worse and worse. When the man in white drenched the cotton in alcohol and began applying it to her veins, Samantha's anxiety had already reached the point where she believed she'd be better off without the shot. Um, I don't think I want to do this. She spoke quietly, not too sure of herself. What are you talking about? This will relieve the headache, the man retorted as he inserted the needle through the cap of the medicine bottle and filled the syringe with a carefully measured dose of the murky liquid. I... I just... The girl sighed once more, too ashamed to admit that she was afraid. Hey, don't freak out on me now, okay? It's just a little sting, that's all. You'll barely even feel it, the doctor assured her. 
Are you going to be all right? I can call a nurse to hold your hand if you want. Sam shook her head. Being treated like a little kid who had to be distracted for a shock would have somehow made the whole situation that much worse for her. Just do it, she spoke, through barely opened lips. The girl closed her eyes, her left hand's fingers clenching tightly. The doctor appeared to take forever, but when the needle finally pierced her skin, she felt every agonising second of it. A tiny whimper escaped her throat as the injection began. Even though it probably wasn't true, Sam could swear that she felt the uncomfortable liquid travel through her veins and towards her heart. Finally, the medic pressed the alcohol-drenched piece of cotton against the insertion point before pulling the needle out. There we go. See? Wasn't too bad. He chuckled patronisingly, untying the rubber band from her biceps. As soon as she felt it was over, Sam attempted to push herself back up, but was quickly stopped by the doctor's hand on her shoulder, which gently pushed her back down on the bed. Hey, hey, why are you in such a hurry? Just rest for a bit. Let the medicine do its thing. You can leave when you're feeling better. Sam inhaled deeply, trying to calm herself down. Really, the only thing in the world that she wanted, even more than feeling better, was to get as far away from this place as possible. Unfortunately, it seemed like she was at the doctor's mercy on this one. She was far too weak to fight back and storm out of there, after all. And even if she would never admit it, she could use the rest. Surprisingly, Sam's headache began to subside mere moments after the injection. Whether it was from the relief from the end of the uncomfortable procedure, the placebo effect, or simply the miraculous medicine circulating in her veins, she didn't know, nor did she care. All that mattered was that, for the first time since the party, Samantha was starting to actually feel like her normal self. Within the next 60 seconds, the nausea had become a mere memory of the past, and the headache was on its way to joining it. Before long, the young girl's head cleared up almost completely, with the only faintest sensation in her forehead, indicating that there was something wrong. Sadly, the medicine couldn't do much about the girl's fatigue. Now that the pounding pain in her head was gone, the tiredness began taking over, quickly clouding her mind and demanding its due. Sam tried to fight it, once again attempting to lift herself from the bed, but her legs wouldn't respond to her at all, and her arms felt somewhat foreign, like she hadn't used them in a very long time. Her eyes kept shutting themselves closed against her will, and her body desperately tried to tell her that she wasn't strong enough to walk out of there on her own. Lacking the energy to fight, Samantha lay back down and relaxed. Five minutes. All she needed was a five-minute power nap, and then she'd be out of there and straight home. Just five minutes. A few knocks echoed through the examination room, followed by the quiet screeching of the door. The doctor turned around to face his nurse, who closed the door behind her and smiled at him. Are you all done? She asked him, glancing slightly at the girl on the examination table. Yep, just finished up. Is our patient here? He spoke. Not yet, I'm afraid. There's been a mix-up with the helicopter. She might be a few hours late, the nurse explained. The doctor only shrugged. Well, our donor isn't going anywhere. Just make sure to take her to the morgue until the patient arrives. Russian researchers in the late 1940s kept five people awake for 15 days using an experimental gas-based stimulant. They were kept in a sealed environment to carefully monitor their oxygen intake so the gas didn't kill them, since it was toxic in high concentrations. This was before closed circuit cameras so they had only microphones and five inch thick glass porthole sized windows into the chamber to monitor them. The chamber was stocked with books, cots to sleep on but no bedding, running water and toilet, and enough dried food to last all five for over a month. The test subjects were political prisoners deemed enemies of the state during World War II. Everything was fine for the first five days. The subjects hardly complained having been promised, falsely, that they would be freed if they submitted to the test and did not sleep for 30 days. Their conversations and activities were monitored, and it was noted that they continued to talk about increasingly traumatic incidents in their past, 
and the general tone of their conversations took on a darker aspect after the four day mark. After five days, they started to complain about the circumstances and events that led them to where they were and started to demonstrate severe paranoia. They stopped talking to each other and began alternately whispering to the microphones and one-way mirrored portholes. Oddly, they all seemed to think they could win the trust of the experimenters by turning over their comrades, the other subjects in captivity with them. At first, the researchers suspected that this was an effect of the gas itself. After nine days, the first of them started screaming. He ran the length of the chamber, repeatedly yelling at the top of his lungs for three hours straight. He continued attempting to scream, but was only able to produce occasional squeaks. The researchers postulated that he had physically torn his vocal cords. The most surprising thing about this behaviour is how the other captives reacted to it, or rather didn't react to it. They continued whispering to the microphones until the second of the captives started to scream. The two non-screaming captives took the books apart, smeared page after page with their own feces and pasted them calmly over the glass portholes. The screaming promptly stopped. So did the whispering to the microphones. After three more days passed, the researchers checked the microphones hourly to make sure they were working, since they thought it impossible that no sound could be coming out with five people inside. The oxygen consumption in the chamber indicated that all five must still be alive. In fact, it was the amount of oxygen five people would consume after a very heavy level of strenuous exercise. On the morning of the 14th day, the researchers did something they said they would not do to get reaction from the captives. They used the intercom inside the chamber, hoping to provoke any response from the captives they were afraid were either dead or vegetables. They announced, We are opening the chamber to test the microphones. Step away from the door and lie flat on the floor or you will be shot. Compliance will earn one of you your immediate freedom. To their surprise, they heard a single phrase in a calm voice respond. We no longer want to be freed. Debate broke out among the researchers and the military forces funding the research. Unable to provoke any more response using the intercom, it was finally decided to open the chamber at midnight on the 15th day. The chamber was flushed of the stimulant gas and filled with fresh air and immediately voices from the microphones began to object. Three different voices began begging, as if pleading for the life of loved ones to turn the gas back on. The chamber was opened and soldiers sent in to retrieve the test subjects. They began to scream louder than ever, and so did the soldiers when they saw what was inside. Four of the five test subjects were still alive, although no one could rightly call the state that any of them in life. The food rations past day five had not been so much as touched. There were chunks of meat from the dead test subjects thighs and chest stuffed into the drain in the centre of the chamber, blocking the drain and allowing four inches of water to accumulate on the floor. Precisely how much of the water on the floor was actually blood was never determined. All four surviving test subjects also had large portions of muscle and skin torn away from their bodies. The destruction of flesh and exposed bone on their fingertips indicated that the wounds were inflicted by hand, not with teeth as the researchers initially thought. Closer examination of the position and angles of the wounds indicated that most, if not all of them, were self-inflicted. The abdominal organs below the ribcage of all four test subjects had been removed. 
While the heart, lungs and diaphragm remained in place, the skin and most of the muscles attached to the ribs had been ripped off, exposing the lungs through the rib cage. All the blood vessels and organs remained intact. They had just been taken out and laid on the floor, fanning out around the eviscerated but still living bodies of the subjects. The digestive tract of all four could be seen to be working, digesting food. It quickly became apparent that what they were digesting was their own flesh that they had ripped off and eaten over the course of the days. Most of the soldiers were Russian special operatives at the facility, but still many refused to return to the chamber to remove the test subjects. They continued to scream to be left in the chamber and alternately begged and demanded that the gas be turned back on, lest they fell asleep. To everyone's surprise, the test subjects put up a fierce fight in the process of being removed from the chamber. One of the Russian soldiers died from having his throat ripped out. Another was gravely injured by having his testicles ripped off and an artery in his leg severed by one of the subject's teeth. Another five of the soldiers lost their lives if you count ones that committed suicide in the weeks following the incident. In the struggle, one of the four living subjects had his spleen ruptured and he bled out almost immediately. The medical researchers attempted to sedate him, but this proved impossible. He was injected with more than ten times the human dose of a morphine derivative and still fought like a cornered animal, breaking the ribs and arm of one doctor. When Hart was seen to beat for a full two minutes after he had bled out to the point that there was more air in his vascular system than blood, even after it stopped, he continued to scream and flail for another three minutes, struggling to attack anyone in reach and just repeating the word, more, over and over, weaker and weaker, until he finally fell silent. The surviving three test subjects were heavily restrained and moved to a medical facility the two with intact vocal cords continuously begging for the gas demanding to be kept awake. The most injured of the three was taken to the only surgical operating room that the facility had. In the process of preparing the subject to have his organs placed back within his body, it was found that he was effectively immune to the sedative they had given him to prepare him for the surgery. He fought furiously against his restraints when the anaesthetic gas was brought out to put him under. He managed to tear most of the way through a four inch wide leather strap on one wrist, even through the weight of a 200 pound soldier holding that wrist as well. It took only a little more anaesthetic than normal to put him under, and the instant his eyelids fluttered and closed, his heart stopped. In the autopsy of the test subject that died on the operating table, it was found that his blood had triple the normal level of oxygen. His muscles that were still attached to his skeleton were badly torn, and he had broken nine bones in his struggle to not be subdued. Most of them were from the force his own muscles had exerted on them. The second survivor had been the first of the group of five to start screaming, his vocal cords destroyed, he was unable to beg or object to surgery, and he only reacted by shaking his head violently in disapproval when the anaesthetic gas was brought near him. He shook his head yes when someone suggested, reluctantly, that they try the surgery without anaesthetic, and did not react for the entire six-hour procedure of replacing his abdominal organs and attempting to cover them with what remained of his skin. The surgeon presiding stated repeatedly that it should be medically impossible for the patient to still be alive. One terrified nurse assisting the surgery stated that she had seen the patient's mouth curl into a smile several times whenever his eyes met hers. When the surgery ended, the subject looked at the surgeon and began to wheeze loudly, 
attempting to talk while struggling. Assuming this must be something of drastic importance, the surgeon had a pen and pad fetched so the patient could write his message. It was simple. Keep cutting. The other two test subjects were given the same surgery, both without anaesthetic as well, although they had to be injected with a paralytic for the duration of the operation. The surgeon found it impossible to perform the operation while the patients laughed continuously. Once paralysed, the subjects could only follow the attending researchers with their eyes. The paralytic cleared their system in an abnormally short period of time, and they were soon trying to escape their bonds. The moment they could speak, they were again asking for the stimulant gas. The researchers tried asking why they had injured themselves why they had ripped out their own guts and why they wanted to be given the gas again. Only one response was given. I must remain awake. All three subjects' restraints were reinforced and they were placed back into the chamber awaiting determination as to what should be done with them. The researchers, facing the wrath of their military benefactors for having failed the stated goals of their project, considered euthanizing the surviving subjects. The commanding officer, an ex-KGB, instead saw potential and wanted to see what would happen if they were put back on the gas. The researchers strongly objected but were overruled. In preparation for being sealed in the chamber again, the subjects were connected to an EEG monitor and had their restraints padded for long-term confinement. To everyone's surprise, all three stopped struggling the moment it was let slip that they were going back on the gas. It was obvious that at this point all three were putting up a great struggle to stay awake. One of the subjects that could speak was humming loudly and continuously, the mute subject was straining his legs against the leather bonds with all his might, first left, then right, then left again for something to focus on. The remaining subject was holding his head off his pillow and blinking rapidly. Having been the first to be wired for EEG, most of the researchers were monitoring his brainwaves in surprise. They were normal most of the time, but sometimes flatlined inexplicably. It looked as if he were repeatedly suffering brain death before returning to normal. As they focused on paper scrolling out of the brainwave monitor, only one nurse saw his eyes slip shut at the same moment his head hit the pillow. His brainwaves immediately changed to that of deep sleep, then flatlined for the last time as his heart simultaneously stopped. The only remaining subject that could speak started screaming to be sealed in now. His brainwaves showed the same flat lines as one who had just died from falling asleep. The commander gave the order to seal the chamber with both subjects inside, as well as three researchers. One of the named three immediately drew his gun and shot the commander point blank between the eyes then turned the gun on the mute subject and blew his brains out as well. He pointed his gun at the remaining subject, still restrained to a bed as the remaining members of the medical and research team fled the room. I won't be locked in here with these things, not with you, he screamed at the man strapped to the table. What are you? he demanded. I must know. The subject smiled. Have you forgotten so easily? The subject asked. We are you. We are the madness that lurks within you all, begging to be free at every moment in your deepest animal mind. We are what you hide from in your beds every night. We are what you sedate into silence and paralysis when you go to the nocturnal haven where we cannot tread. The researcher paused, then aimed at the subject's heart and fired. EEG flatlined as the subject weakly choked out. So nearly free.
In any city, in any country, go to any mental institution or halfway house you can get yourself to. When you reach the front desk, ask the worker there if the holder of illusion is housed here. If the worker nods, you are doomed. The holder has anticipated your arrival and you will feel your body slowly begin to fade out of existence. It is not a pleasant experience. If the worker answers no, be thankful. She will hand you a sheet of paper with directions on getting to the proper asylum and ask you to leave. Do so, turn left and throw away the paper. You don't want to alert the holder to your coming before it is necessary. Walk four blocks down the road in the direction you're heading, then turn right and walk one, then left and walk two, then stop, scratch your chin and turn around. The street has changed. All the colour has drained from the world in front of you. A huge crater gapes from the centre of the street. Not a pane of glass remains intact, and all the people you might have passed on that block lie horribly dead. Take a step back. There should be a red paint pen on the ground beside you. Grab it and stuff it into your pocket. As you watch, the discoloration effect slowly spreads revealing what looks like the aftermath of a military attack on a black and white world, smashed buildings, blasted streets, and dead people everywhere. Quickly cover your eyes with your hands and shout, I deny the truth, let the path remain. If the holder deems you unworthy, you will suffer the same fate as the block, and the effect you saw will continue to spread, wiping the illusion clean from our world. But if you pass, a slight tingle will shoot through your legs, just barely powerful enough to be felt. Open your eyes, the effect is still spreading, but you stand fully as you were in the middle of its ruin. Walk straight down the block until you come to a warehouse. The main doors, though bent and dinged, still stand strong. Next to the doors is a building nameplate, like the ones you see on firehouses and the like. But completely blank. Take out the paint pen and write on the plate, as small as you can, while still writing legibly. Who survived to tell of it? The ink will pull into a dot and then begin to drip, much like blood, down the plate. It will describe the survivor telling his tale of horror and sadness, and the ends to which he fell in an attempt to get the tale out, to try and ensure that it would not happen again. Slowly, you will get the horrible feeling that the holder himself was the survivor spoken of. He will assure you that this is not true, however, and end the tale with, His fate bears not for the telling, but his legacy lives on. The paint pen will melt in your hand, and the side door to the warehouse will crash open. Run inside, do not walk, and enter the manager's office. It will be completely dark, but dare you not light it up in any way, lest you awaken the guardian from his dreams. Instead, grope around on the desk until you feel an object, round and smooth in your hands. The office will flash out of sight, and you will get a brief glimpse of the massacred street in full colour, before everything goes black. You will wake up two days later, sitting at the kitchen table in your home. A newspaper nearby screams of a terrorist attack. Sit up, and you'll realise that you still hold the object. Set it on the table. The object you see before you is a steel ball, about the size of a walnut, and is object 51 out of 538. The survivor now knows of you, and you of him. This jealous secret will bind for all time. I need the noise here. I can't have a moment of true silence here. It's not hard to remedy if you live in even a poor home. I have the fish tank filter running, but it's not enough. I need people. Human voices cure the pain. Law and Order episodes have just the right amount of characters to keep the talking running. It's still not enough. 
I play it on the TV while I run another show on my computer to have a sickening overlap of gibberish. It's just right, like the smallest bed in the room was right for that furry little piece of shit in the book the man reads me when he wants me to hear his own voice. Calm down, he says. I can't calm down. My home has been invaded, so I need to keep it together. Don't put anything more than arms reach away. At first you feel like a pack rat, but it's for your own good. Don't step off your bed either. That whole hand coming out from under the bed trick is enough to send you screaming into the night. It's only got me once. Once was all I got to get a few fingers and keep them on the nightstand in a jar. So I know he's real. Make sure the lights stay on until sunrise when you can sleep. A lot of helpful websites make sure you can count to the very minute that the sun begins to come up. When they do, don't tuck in immediately. If you live in a place like I do, with the mountains in the way of the sunlight, you need to wait until the ambient light fills the room, just past the pretty orange that hacks like to photograph. Rainy and cloudy days are days you get to stay up again. If you live in Seattle, it was nice knowing you. He's quiet. He's patient. He wants me to sleep so he can stand over me again. He wants that peace inside my head that opens a door. I can't write his name, his shape, his form, or anything that will let it spread. Words are power. The night is like a vacuum that he can go through. Just keep him away from the quiet dark. It's not dark. It's him. Just take the pills and everything will be fine, David. I'd trust my doctor more if he wasn't wearing the coat that was covered in the blood of the last one. It's not the pills that make his coat less dirty. I see them when I'm on them too. He wants me to take them because I know he slipped a tranquilizer into the bottle that matches the others. If I take that again, I'll wake up missing another few pieces of my skin. My last few patches taken still red as a reminder. He loves to stand in the corner, five feet away from the bed, knowing I'll lash out if he gets any closer. Marking the spots on the floor in the daytime, I can keep an eye on the son of a bitch. I have to wait until the sunrise to kill him. He keeps letting it through the window every evening after the sun goes down. It crawls like a snake to the under of the bed, calling the others with its slow and deep groan like vomit rising through its throat. Some of them look like the one that loves the underside of my mattress. Some of them stand in a semicircle around the man in the bloody coat and sway back and forth like a tree branch. They creak in their sway. I keep the remote handy as the few that circle the bloody piece of shit make noises at each other. I turn up the TV and they shriek at the noises. I need the noises here. It's the only thing that keeps them away. If there was anyone to be found on Santa's naughty list, it was surely Cindy's older sister, Maddie. Cindy was eight and Maddie was three years more and had never said a nice thing to Cindy in her life. Or so it seemed. Cindy's my favourite. Cindy's so pretty. Cindy this, Cindy that. These were the words from Maddie's mother that rang in Maddie's head through every day of the year, but especially around Christmas time, when Cindy was talking sweetly of gift giving and decorating and loving her family and friends. Cindy was sweet, but it was authentic. All she really wanted was to be loved by Maddie the way she herself loved Maddie. Since Cindy was a baby, Maddie hadn't liked her. Some of Cindy's earliest memories revolved around the constant sideways looks she would receive from Maddie, the passive aggression, the endless competitions for Mum's affection. Cindy was always the one to receive it, but on certain days she would ask her mother to pay Maddie some attention. Oh, your sister's fine, her mother would say. Your sister gets plenty of attention. And after saying this, her mother would usually give Maddie a half-hearted pat on the head 
and go right back to giving Cindy all the affection a child would ever need. It left a hollow place in Cindy. And when she tried to give Maddie the love she so desperately needed, Maddie would shun Cindy as if Cindy were a leper. Now this year, Maddie had been extra bitter. Perhaps it was the additional attention Cindy garnered for her performance in the school's Christmas play. Or maybe it was the way Mum constantly bragged about Cindy's acting. Ooh, she's the next Meryl Streep, I'm telling you, Cindy's mother would brag. But whatever the reason, Maddie took every chance she saw to torment her younger sister. Cindy woke up one morning with gum in her hair. Another day, she found that her underwear was soaked in honey. Her favourite dolls would go missing. The TV in her room, which Maddie wasn't allowed to have, was constantly unplugged. Yet Cindy's desire for her sister's acceptance continued through the month of December. She continued to be kind. She persisted in giving Maddie compliments when Mother did not. The gift at the top of Maddie's Christmas list was a brand new makeup kit. Cindy made sure that she would be the one to give it to her Christmas morning. Despite all this, Cindy had felt a wear and tear from all of Maddie's torments throughout the month and it came to a breaking point on Christmas Eve. The family sat at the Christmas Eve dinner table and ate ham and mashed potatoes and Christmas cookies. Cindy's mother had been bragging shamelessly all night long about Cindy's acting. There was no mention of Maddie. Not at any point. Maddie was stewing and Cindy could see it. At one point, through all the bragging and praising and gloating, Maddie chimed in. I don't think Cindy's acting is that good, she said matter-of-factly. It was as though a bomb had gone off in the room. Everyone looked at Maddie like they were unsure they'd heard correctly. It was like blasphemy. What kind of a thing is that to say? asked Mother. Maddie shrugged. I don't know, said Maddie. I just think you're exaggerating a little bit. I mean, she's decent. All of the memories of Maddie's torments began to broil and fester in Cindy's mind. And now, here was Maddie, disparaging Cindy at the dinner table in front of the entire family, in front of all the aunts and uncles and cousins and friends. At least I'm good at something, Cindy blurted. And just like that, Maddie retracted into a pit of shame. Cindy's words ringing true and humiliating. Mother added fuel to the fire by shrugging at Maddie in a matter-of-fact manner. "'Your sister's got a good point,' said Mother. Cindy felt horrible as she watched Maddie sulk and trudge off toward the bathroom like a beaten dog. Cindy hated the power she held in her hands. That night, everyone hunkered down in their beds and waited for Santa to leave his gifts below the tree. But Cindy had trouble sleeping. It was midnight now. Cindy rarely found herself awake at this hour, but she knew why. Cindy removed her covers and hopped out of bed and tiptoed across the room. She was careful not to wake anyone. She opened her closet and grabbed Maddie's wrapped gift. She tiptoed down the dark hallway and dragged her fingers along the wall so as not to stumble around in the dark. I'll give Maddie her gift and tell her I'm sorry, and tell her I love her, Cindy thought to herself. That's what I'll do, and she'll be happy, and she'll forgive me, and maybe she'll even say she loves me too. When Cindy arrived outside of Maddie's door, she heard strange shuffling noises coming from inside. Perhaps Maddie was preparing another prank for Cindy, no matter. Cindy was going to walk in and give Maddie her present and try to make amends. Cindy opened the door just a crack. She was careful not to startle Maddie. It was so dark inside the room and she couldn't see a thing. But she could hear a great deal of shuffling inside the room. Cindy stared into the room for quite some time, patiently waiting for her eyes to adjust to the gloom. When her eyes adjusted, she saw an empty bed. She saw Maddie's wide open window. 
she saw a seven-foot figure standing in the shadows. She saw the round cage upon its back, and she saw Maddie sitting in the cage like a frightened bird. As Cindy's terrified eyes further adjusted to the dark, she saw the figure more clearly. It had a goat's head with large horns on top. Its eyes were red and impish and hostile. It wore a suit much like Santa Claus, and it even had jingling sleigh bells hanging from a few ends of the garments. Cindy stood frozen with fear as the creature glanced at her and gave her a nod and a wink. The creature made its way toward the window. As it did, the last Cindy saw of her sister was a look of fear and sadness and regret. And then the creature left as Cindy stood there with the present in her hands. Down the chimney he will come, with his big great grin, and you'll find that even the kiddies are very liable to sin. What will Krampus say when he finds everybody sinning? What will Krampus say when he hears them sin, sin, sinning? Twelve seems to be the age when kids start putting the heat on their parents about the truth behind Santa. I was certainly no exception to this rule. How were Santa's elves able to make that video game I wanted in their workshop? I thought Nintendo owned Mario. Or how about the ever-infamous visiting every house in one night question? Did the jolly man own some kind of time-extending device? Or perhaps the most obvious question of all, how could he have lived for this long? A lot of people say he trains apprentices who take his place every few decades. Others claim he's just immortal. As for everything else, magic seemed to be the universal lie everyone had agreed on. Whatever the case, I just went along with the conclusion that it was my parents doing. Of course, they'd deny it and claim ignorance if I confronted them, but it wasn't enough to dissuade my beliefs. So one Christmas Eve, when I couldn't sleep as these questions danced among my dreams of sugar cereals and new games, I decided to investigate the noises coming from my living room. This time, surely, I would catch my dad or mum in the act of stowing presents under the tree. At least then, they'd let me in on the truth. But as I entered the living room, I saw a man before me that I did not recognise. He was dressed in red and white, with a slightly overweight body, and he wore a stringy fake white beard. His hair, or what remained of it, was greying around the edges of his classic Santa hat, and his eyes were wide with fright as he dropped a present under the tree. Being the intuitive youth I was, I came to one of two conclusions. Either this was a home invader stealing my family's gifts, or this was the real Santa. I opened my mouth to scream, but the man rushed towards me and covered my mouth. Shh, 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 he said, putting a finger to his mouth, trying a smile. Tears began to roll down my cheeks. I was petrified of this man. Then, slowly, he took back his hand and extended it towards me. It's all right there, little one. You know who I am, right? I nodded not shaking his hand back. The trembling man nodded as well, then grabbed an empty sack lying on the floor and gestured to the tree. Look, see, I bring gifts. Now run along to bed or I might have to put you on the naughty list. He started drifting towards the deeper, hearty tones stereotypically associated with Kris Kringle. But I wasn't fooled. Regardless, I wiped my eyes and began to step back from the living room, trying to create some distance between me and the stranger. The man simply watched, wiped his brow and proceeded to approach the fireplace. I stopped and observed, confused as to how he was going to leave my house. But a blast of green flames erupted from the chimney and the man fell back to the floor. I couldn't see his face, but I'm certain it was twisted in fear like my own. A massive, 
bony hand spawned from the fire, and the arm that followed was draped in raggedy fur. Then another arm, and then the skull of some wild creature with two large horns followed, nearly as large as the fireplace itself. The bones popped and snapped as it slammed its hands onto the floor. The entire monster was engulfed in the flame, yet it did not seem to burn anything in the house. The monster declared, speaking to what I guessed to be the man on the floor. No, no, Eddie shouted back. I did my part, see? 10,000 homes, just like you said, right? 10,000, I, I did my part. And yet you allowed a human child to see. L look, I have learned my lesson. I'm sorry. I made a mistake. Just let go, please. I delivered all the- Let you go? Did you let that woman go, Eddie? I don't seem to recall you letting her go. This was your second chance, and you wasted it. What are you going to do? Eddie whispered. I could make out his quaking figure being overshadowed by the creature in the fireplace. The next sound to be heard was a crunch, with a soft beginning and snapping finish. I jumped as the sound repeated a few times, finally letting out a shaky breath. I prayed in my head that it wasn't what I thought, but when the creature reared its head towards me, I saw the red and white pants hanging from its mouth as it chewed on Eddie's corpse, then watched it slurp up his legs like strands of spaghetti. I covered my eyes and tried to tell myself it wasn't real. It wasn't real. It wasn't real. And after a quiet minute, I peeped between my fingers to see the monster staring back at me from the fireplace. The pace of my breathing grew quicker and sharper, my eyes unable to escape from the grasp of those empty eye sockets. Now, run up back to jail, little one. Or else I might put you on the naughty list. My legs finally found the strength to leave, and I sprinted for my parents' room, diving into the sheets with them. There wasn't a trace of the events of the night before when my family went down to the tree next morning. There was even a little note next to an empty glass and a half-eaten cookie on the table. Have a Merry Christmas, S. Claus. As much as I tried to take in the warm, comforting atmosphere that came with Christmas Day, I couldn't stop watching the fireplace, terrified that the monster would return. At the least, now I knew the truth about Santa Claus.